Good morning, folks. My name is Jerry Bashar with the ISO Stakeholder Affairs. My pleasure to welcome you to the kickoff to discuss our newest storage initiative here at the ISO called Energy Storage Enhancement. Uh, you may also have heard ESE because we love our acronyms. And we very much welcome and appreciate those of you who have participated in our stakeholder processes in the past. We do pride ourselves on the fact that we have a very open and transparent process uh, for incorporating your input to guide our initiatives here. And of course, being on the cutting edge of integrating renewables at the KAISO combined with last summer's events that highlighted the continued need for storage onto our grid. We very much look forward to continuing to work with you in more efficiently refining our storage participation models. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and introduce my colleagues here today, starting with the lead for this initiative. Uh, Gabe, go ahead if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. This is Gabe Bertaw. I'm the lead policy developer um, in, at the ISO for infrastructure and regulatory policy. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, Bill? Uh, this is Bill Weaver. I'm the uh, lawyer for Gabe and Bridget. Thanks, Bill and Bridget. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bridget Sparks, and I'm an infrastructure and regulatory policy specialist. Thanks, Bridget. And I see Ong. Hi, this is Ong uh, from the Reliability and Market Operation Engineering. Thanks, Ong. Debbie? Deb Levine, Director of Infrastructure Contracts and Management. Thanks, Debbie. I see Bob. Bob Cott, uh, Operations Policy Manager. Thanks, Bob. I see Rahul. Hi, this is Rahul Kalaskar, Manager for Market Validation and Analysis. Thanks, Rahul. I see Tyler. Thanks, Jimmy. Tyler DeBester, um, Senior Market Design Analyst in MSDC. Thanks, Tyler. If there's anyone I missed at the ISO, of course, please feel free to introduce yourself. Great. Uh, so as you can see, our agenda for today will be to discuss what the ISO has proposed for the initial scope of this initiative, uh, which as you can see, focuses on enhancements to the real-time market, followed by discussions on ensuring state of charge or SOC, uh, then variable charging rates, and finally touching on exceptional dispatch issues before concluding for today. In addition, calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to the recordings after the meetings. The recordings will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meetings, and the recordings and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. Moving on, here you can see a typical simple display of our stakeholder process. As you can see, we're in the issue paper phase, normally uh, or I should say, we don't always start with the issue paper for initiatives. Uh, issue paper is more focused on items that we want to include within the scope for the initiative. So as such, we do encourage your comments today to sort of be based largely around that and any sort of solution-based comments or ideas. Uh, we do appreciate and, and encourage those to be submitted perhaps in written comments uh, as, as those are more you know, proposal-based, and that sort of begins in the straw proposal stage. So uh, this is more of what items we think should be in scope and appreciate your related feedback along those lines. And lastly, I will note, if you have any questions, please push pound two. And we do take questions in advance as uh, stated in our market notice for these meetings. We didn't receive any questions. However, we did receive one late set uh, that you know, we can uh, start before we do move on to verbal questions. We appreciate that. And uh, after raising your hand, just push pound two once to keep your hand raised and we'll be sure to get to you. So with that, I will kick it over to Gabe. 
Thank you for that introduction, Jimmy. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, you know, I, I think in the past we've had a lot of discussion about storage resources. Um, and I think the, the last time we really had, uh, you know, good open dialogue about, you know, starting from scratch of, about developing you know, if, if we could potentially develop anything for storage resources, how would we go about doing that? Um, was not last summer, but the summer before while we were working on our ESDER 4 policy initiative. Um, during that initiative and at that time, the ISO had a little bit less than 200 megawatts of storage on the system. And we knew that in the future we would be getting a lot more, but we didn't quite have a sense of the magnitude of storage and how quickly it would come onto the grid. Today, I would, you know, I, I think we're in a fairly similar situation. We are starting a brand new initiative, this initiative, the Energy Storage Enhancements Initiative. We have the ability to, you know, think broadly, at least at this point, about what kinds of concerns are out there surrounding storage resources. We know what sort of framework we have with our current market construct, but we do have the ability to potentially alter and update that market construct to better accommodate storage resources. So as Jimmy has already noted, I would like to use the time that we have today to think about the issues related to storage, what are the pain points, I think compared to where we were two years ago, we have a lot better sense about what the needs are for the storage resources that we have on our grid today, which are, you know, about 500, uh, almost 600 megawatts of installed capacity. And we're anticipating close to 2,000 megawatts um, during this, this coming summer. Um, so with the information that we have about the resources that are already participating in our grid and the information that we have about how the resources we anticipate participating in our grid, I think we've got a pretty good idea about, you know, what the issues are for the existing storage fleet. Now, I would caveat and say that we will likely have, you know, in our next generation of storage resources that join the California ISO fleet, they may not be the same technology and they may not be the same, you know, relatively short duration batteries that we have right now and that we're anticipating for this summer. Um, and we may need to think about new solutions to accommodate those resources as well. Um, but I think compared to where we were two years ago, we do have a lot better appreciation for some of the issues um, that concern, you know, the, the fleet that we're going to see for this summer. So with that said, uh, Jimmy, we can advance the next slide. Um, I, I do want to sort of, you know, put into context here a little bit of, you know, where we've come from and where we could potentially go. Um, we have a current market construct that was generally designed to facilitate gas resources, and it does a good job doing that. Um, you know, gas resources have the ability to typically produce on a 24 by 7 basis. As long as there's gas, they can be turning that gas into electricity. Um, they have costs generally that change with their output range. So as they produce more, typically costs increase for gas resources. Storage resources behave very differently than gas resources. And, and again, these are the same kinds of conversations that we had, you know, early on in our development of uh, the ESDER policy. Um, storage resources have the ability to, you know, arbitrage energy so they can charge at one point in the day and they could save that energy for discharge later in the day or potentially even um, during later days. There's obviously an incentive to do this, uh, a financial incentive, because uh, of the nature of how prices are formed in our market. So prices are typically lowest in the California ISO market during the periods when solar is highest. So those would be the periods when we have the highest net demand. That's, and that's load minus 
uh, solar and wind generation, and that tends to be the lowest when we have all of our solar on the system, which we have about uh, 13,000 megawatts of installed utility-scale solar on, on the California grid. Um, they also, I think, you know, it's important to note that storage to date has found um, some profitability and is generally participating in the ISO ancillary service market. We often see um, storage resources providing regulation services to the ISO. We anticipate that as more storage joins our grid, again, as we're um, anticipating, uh, gearing up for this summer, that those um, regulation revenues you know, as we get more supply, will start to decrease. And the, the regulation aspect or, or profitability aspect for storage resources may not be as great as um, they are for storage resources today. Um, storage resources, most of what we have on our grid right now is uh, four-hour duration lithium-ion batteries. And that's, again, most what we're anticipating um, for this summer and for the coming summers. Uh, but we've also heard a lot of talk, and I think there's some movement and some um, test projects around other potential technologies for storage. Um, some other technologies work differently than lithium-ion storage and may require uh, different market tools in order to model these resources and to ensure that we capture the cost of these resources accurately um, and, and we get the compensation right for these resources. So I, I, I think in summation, you know, we've outlined in this issue paper a list of the, the highest profile issues that we've heard over the last year or so, inclusive of some of the issues we sort of left on the table from the ESDR 4 initiative. Um, I think I, I, you know, I don't think that we're necessarily going to uh, develop solutions for each and every one of these um, um, potential issues. I think some of them may be left for the future, but there may also be issues that we haven't included um, in this issue paper at all. And to the extent that these issues are relevant and they are of concern to the stakeholder community at large, I think you know, the ISO is interested in capturing those as issues and then potentially working out solutions. And in that same vein, a lot of these issues sort of go back to how we represent storage resources in our market, how the market that we have today, again, this market that was set up for gas resources, um, and how we've changed it and, and sort of augmented it to facilitate the storage fleet that we have. Um, it may not be the most appropriate thing to change the market. There may be substantial or whole-scale changes that we can make that would better accommodate storage resources and might make some of these issues that we've outlined in the paper obsolete or moot. In that case, I think, you know, we are open and, and potentially willing to explore other ways to model storage. Um, to date, I don't, you know, I have thought about some other solutions, but I don't know that we have necessarily a leading contender or anything like that, um, which we think is necessarily a, a feasible and workable approach going forward um, with what we anticipate our storage uh, resources to be over the next few years. But we are willing to entertain at least or at least start the dialogue on you know, thinking about how to make some of these changes if, if that's something that this community is interested in. Um, we can advance the next slide, Jimmy, please. So with that said, I, I do want to just provide a little bit more background before we start walking through the issues. Um, I, I would note that in the Ezra 4 Stakeholder Initiative, we spent a lot of time thinking about how storage resources are modeled and how the cost of storage resources should be reflected. I think we came up with um, three primary areas where cost for storage would come from. I think the first area is energy costs. So a storage resource inherently has to buy energy from the grid in order to have the energy available to sell at a later time. 
Um, there are some associated charging costs with that. And there's also losses. Um, so there's round trip efficiencies. So when a storage resource charges 10 megawatt hours of energy, perhaps they only have 8.5 megawatt hours of energy to sell at a later time. So those costs also need to be included. Um, there's also, in addition to round trip efficiencies, there's also parasitic losses. So if the storage resource is charged, um, you know, all, all the way up to, to full capacity, over time that state of charge slowly degrades um, and those costs may also need to be included. I think for the purposes of most lithium-ion batteries, we haven't really gotten in modeling parasitic losses, and we haven't, you know, I, I think they're relatively low for lithium-ion batteries, and we haven't done a whole lot of work to model those, uh, but that might be one of the things that we explore um, in this policy. There's also um, marginal costs. To, to charge and discharge resources. So there's some natural wear and tear that occurs as um, storage charges and discharges. And at, over time, that wear and tear could necessitate cell augmentation for the storage facility. So to the extent that storage resources are anticipating that cell augmentation and it's a direct result from the charging and discharging action, those variable costs should be included and accounted for and compensated for storage resources. Finally, there's also opportunity costs. So if you are a you know, four-hour duration battery, then you have the ability to charge up to you know, four hours of a, you know, continuous discharge in the future. But that means that if there's five hours of availability um, when you could potentially discharge and prices are you know, quote unquote high, you won't necessarily have the option to discharge during all five hours. And ideally, you'd really only want to be discharging during the four highest price hours or the four highest price intervals across a subset of hours where prices are the highest. Um, to the extent that that energy that a storage resource has charged is less than you know a 24-hour period or something like that, or the optimization period. Um, op, you know, opportunity costs do need to be included and compensated for storage resources as well. So, you know, the answer for and, and I and I think this kind of goes back to what I was talking about in the previous slide. But the answer for policy assumes some simplifications for storage resources. Um, I, I think at this point in the policy, we are open to um, further expansions on the policy that we've developed in Ezra 4, but we're also open to more holistic changes if um, those might be appropriate and could potentially address uh, larger concerns from um, you know, the stakeholder community. So um, with that, and, and I know Jimmy sort of teed this up, um, I'd like to focus today's conversation on the issues that are related to storage resources. I know in the paper we've we've gone into a little bit of some potential ideas about where we think we could head for some solutions. I don't necessarily want to get bogged down in the details of, oh, this solution is a really good idea, so we should do this, or, oh, this solution is a really bad idea. I'd much rather focus today's conversation on um, what are the key issues around storage resources? Um, potentially, maybe, maybe at a very high level, you know, here's something you could potentially do to address that. I think we would like to start seeing some feedback about potential solutions in the written comments, um, and, and we'll take those and we'll consider those internally as we're developing our first straw proposal for this uh, initiative. Um, but I, I think for today, yeah, if we could just limit the conversation to uh, the issues around storage, I think that would be helpful for us to kind of um, wrap our heads around, you know, what the scope should be for this policy and um, hopefully get some sort of a prioritization of, oh, these are the really critical key issues that we need to address, and maybe we'll get some feedback today about, oh, you know, we've seen this issue in the past, but it has been an issue recently, so we might not need to address it at all in this policy, uh, which would be fine. Um, I would also add, you know, I, I know it's uh, 9.30 right now. I don't anticipate taking the full three hours, but we certainly can, and we've got this time earmarked 
um, for this discussion. And then, um, you know, the final thing I would note is, you know, the ISO understands that this is a really critical policy for moving our grid from where we are today going into the future. We know that we're going to need storage resources to make that transition and to meet our 2045 goals for greenhouse gas emissions and interim goals along the way. Um, to the extent that we get the right policies in place for storage resources, I, I mean, it's critical uh, for the grid to move forward. So we do want to take the right amount of time to develop this policy. I think in a previous version of the ISO policy roadmap, we initially stated that we wanted to have this policy developed by December of this year. I, you know, fr frankly, with the scope of work that we have, I don't think that that's going to be possible. Um, we've gotten buy-in from our senior management um, to make sure that we do take the right amount of time on this policy and take this to the Board of Governors after these, um, you know, policy issues have been fully vetted and we have good, thorough solutions worked out through the stakeholder process and potentially through working groups if we need them um, before going to the Board of Governors. So I, I think that there is a need to move fast on some of these issues because some of these issues are concerns for the storage community and there are things that need to be updated and changed, but there's also a, a drive and a push um, both from internal parties and external parties to make sure that we develop the right policy and that we don't rush too quickly on this. Um, so typically, sort of in, in, in the early stages of, of policy work, we usually do have a calendar worked out um, just for uh, purposes of uh, stakeholders knowing what's coming up and, and sort of a target date for when we're going to go to the Board of Governors. We have not developed that yet for this policy, um, and, and I just want to state that I don't think there's any uh, pressure, at least internally, for us to get to the December Board of Governors, and I would expect that we target a Board of Governors date sometime in maybe Q1 or Q2 of 2022, um, but I think a lot of it's dependent on, you know, how much policy we bite off in this initiative um, and how broad the scope is. Okay, um, Jimmy, I'm going to pause now for questions. I don't know if we uh, – let me just see if I can pull up anything. Have we gotten anything in the chat yet? Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate all that information for folks. I don't see anything in the chat, uh, but as mentioned, we did receive one uh, written question beforehand that I can quickly go through, and you and the group can add, of course, if you want. Uh, so this question was received from the CPC, so we appreciate that. First question, uh, how does the KAISA propose to assess, <coughs> excuse me, the net GHG impacts of the alternative market rules and market system revisions under consideration in the in this initiative. So great question, uh, right? You know, storage is critical to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but no specific metrics tied to this initiative for that uh, and how we account for GHG changes. So a good question. Uh, we second question, so there's five questions here. Second one, uh, the ESE issue paper does not specifically address co-located and hybrid storage. Are there specifics to these resources that should be included within ESE? Uh, and if so, will the CAISO coordinate the ESE with the hybrid storage initiative? And as you may know, uh, co-located resources uh, can and do include storage. So yes, to the extent that storage resources are co-located, this would directly impact that. Uh, and we had initially planned to actually start a new policy for hybrid resources early this year but instead elected to delay that uh, so that work can be completed in the uh, in this initiative for that. So look forward to those. And uh, of course, there'll be a high degree of coordination uh, between these. Uh, third question, uh, how will the dispatch of energy storage within the five minute real time market interval for the provision of ancillary services? be taken into account for determining the procurement need for stored energy products, which Gabe will go over here later in the presentation. Uh, similarly, how will ancillary services or AS energy dispatch be constrained by 
the minimum state of charge requirements in the real-time market. Uh, the ISO hasn't made a formal proposal yet for what, you know, if any new products will be developed during the ESC initiative, uh, such as the stored energy product. Uh, but once we, once we do, of course, we'll begin developing details about how that would be implemented. And we, of course, welcome input on preferred approaches from stakeholders uh, at this time. Like we mentioned, this is the scoping phase of this initiative. So the fourth question, I can also put this in chat for folks once I'm through. Uh, fourth question, will the ESE initiative be coordinated with the RAE or Resource Adequacy Initiative? Yes, we do. We will be sure to definitely coordinate any cross issues. Uh, there would be likely significant dependencies between the two and development of new market tools uh, definitely necessitate, necessi excuse me, necessitates the proper resource accuracy rules to ensure reliable operations with those market tools. And then lastly, will the CAISO conduct modeling studies to evaluate, evaluate reliability under each of the proposed market rules and systems revisions? And if so, what metrics would be used for that? And in short, we are not uh, planning any specific studies around reliability. Uh, for any of the different potential proposed approaches. Uh, so with that, like I mentioned, I'll go ahead and paste these in the chat. And I'm not sure, operator, if we have any verbal questions to take at this time. We do have think, a few here in the line. Would you like to take them? Well, I think we had a couple of questions come into the chat, so maybe we should um, address those first, and then we'll take the questions on the, on the line. Okay, thanks, Gabe. Yeah, I do see we do have a question from the chat. So this question is from Richard Anderson. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Gabe. It just came in. I missed that. So Richard asks, how will this initiative account for longer duration storage? Do you plan on implementing a tiered structure for discharged hours? And he provides an example for folks, and I can put that example on the, on the chat for everybody. So I'm not sure, Gabe, if you can see that example. Uh, but, for example, he says Tier 1 that would be one hour, Tier 2 would be three to five hours, Tier 3 would be six to eight hours, six to eight hours, excuse me, and then Tier 4 longer than eight hours. I'm not sure, Gabe, if you have an answer for that at this time. Yeah, um, you know, I, I do think that one of the one of the the sort of hot topics and and something that a lot of people are discussing <clears throat> excuse me inside of the ISO and outside of the ISO are around long duration storage i don't think it's a secret that um the ISO is not going to be able to meet 2045 goals without developing a lot of long duration storage um and that and that's going to mean you know, it's probably significantly longer than a lot of the four-hour duration batteries that we have on our system right now, which isn't to say we're not going to need the short duration as well, um, but, but we're going to need to start uh, working very quickly on uh, longer duration batteries. Um, we have, and, and I, I think that that sentiment is sort of echoed in um, the most recent IRP from the CPC, which is requiring 1,000 megawatts of um, long duration storage to be procured um, in, in the next few years. So, you know, with, with that said, I do think we are broadly looking at, um, you know, solutions to, you know, compensation problems for storage resources. And we have outlined in this presentation, and, and we can chat more about this when we get there, solutions and what we're thinking about in terms of replacement mechanisms for the minimum state of charge requirement, which is essentially the tool that we're implementing for, with two-year authority uh, for this summer and next summer to ensure on the most critical days that our storage fleet has a significant enough state of charge to be able to um, meet discharge schedules in the day ahead market um, um, th that are that are scheduled. 
And what we're working on in this initiative is to come up with a compensation mechanism for that. And it could be the case that the compensation mechanism that we come up with does have a tiered approach where storage resources that are providing additional storage uh, or additional storage capability do get compensated at higher rates. And I think that very much gets into how do we start formulating the solutions for these problems rather than what is the problem. So one potential problem that, that you may be raising here is, you know, how do we or, or should we potentially compensate long-duration storage more than short-duration storage? Um, and, and I think as far as the solution, let's continue to think about this as we move through the stakeholder process and start to publish straw proposals. And as we do, let's make sure that we're, you know, addressing the issue. So hopefully that helps. So, Jimmy, I think we had um, one or two more questions in the chat. Do you just yeah, want to read thanks, those? Dave, for that. Yeah, I do see another chat question that came in earlier for from Ryan uh, Quaderno. He asked, do we know the percentage of energy storage that is set up as an NPR and EIM, NPR, I'm assuming meaning, meaning non-participating resource? Um, I don't know, Gabe, if you can answer that or if anyone from the ISO more familiar with our EIM, EIM side want to chime in, you can push pound two to identify your line yep. on that. Yeah, I don't know the can... quantity of storage that, that's participating from the EIM market. Um, I do know that in general it's, it's not very much. Um, I have talked to EIM entities, and I know that there are several that are developing storage projects. Um, yeah, and I'm just getting a chat right now from our operations folks that says there is indeed none uh, no storage resources in EIM. But I would say that several EIM participants are working to develop storage resources and they're thinking hard about how they can get those um, storage resources to participate in the ISO market and I believe take advantage of some of the energy arbitrage opportunities. So to the extent that um, storage resources are EIM and EIM participating, um, the rule that we've set out in uh, this stakeholder initiative and, uh, and the previous initiatives uh, would apply to those resources. So this isn't necessarily a uh, policy that's only centered around ISO resources, but instead any uh, participating um, storage resource in the fleet, including EIM. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. So that might have been further. Second question oh, as well. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm not seeing any more chat questions. Well, I'm missing something, operator. Um, but oh, actually, I do see one from Bora Akil. Sorry, Bora. Well, there's a lot of back and forth, but I do see that question now. Bora is asking, will this policy affect resources that are in WEC, uh, not in the Kaiser region, but that participate in the Kaiser markets? So yeah, and, and, I, and Bora, thanks for the question. I think that's what I just answered. I, I think the answer is yes. Great, I don't see uh, any further questions. So operator, uh, I think we have a few in the queue, so please feel free to open the queue. Thanks a lot. All right, your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Susan Schneider, Phoenix Consultant. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, Susan, good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, I have a couple of process suggestions. Um, first of all, when you have when you put down somebody's name, if you couldn't say what organization they're from, that would be helpful. So we all know that. Um, my second suggestion is that if you uh, is it possible to to, tap, to print out within the chat room? Because otherwise, we end up sort of you know frantically writing things down before they change. And it is it is is that going to be posted somewhere potentially, or could that be so we don't have to do that? I'm oh, sorry, Susan. Could you repeat the, the ask one more time? I apologize. Yeah, the ask, the ask is if there's a, if there could be if the chat whatever you're putting up in the chat room. Uh, you know, you're reading all these questions, and I, I don't know about anyone else, but frantically trying to write these things down. Um, if there's any way to, to either post those later so that they could, people could see them later, or make it possible to print them or something, so that people don't have to do it. Because I mean, you're trying to frantically write that, and you kind of miss 
some of the other discussions. So, um, if you yeah, think so more looking kitchen. at the questions that it, yeah, the thing, that's great input, Susan. Yeah, I'm trying to make sure that everyone sees those questions. So, for instance, the questions right. that we received in chat, I think we received were since all the panelists, I'm trying to copy and paste yeah, them. Yeah, no, no, we can see them in the chat room, but we have to then frankly take them, you know, write them down because they're not, they don't exist anywhere else. Sure. I'm just wondering if that could be, maybe they could be posted later yeah. or something well, like that. Yeah, we try to accommodate as best we can chat, live chats during the meeting, so that's good input to relate to the vendor. Okay. So, okay. Um, maybe, okay. though, maybe uh, if folks could, whenever they do put the chat, just, you know, make sure to select all attendees when sending your chat, so that way everybody can yeah. see it. But still, then everybody has to write it down if it's up on the screen instead of being able to look at it later or, have, you know, have you write it down or, or, or be able to print it or something. It's just otherwise everyone has to take notes of what's on the chat. We can see it, but it's still, it doesn't exist later. That's that's my problem. So, I mean, I have some actual yeah, stuff to, to say to you, too, but I, I just wish you could yeah. you figure out how to how to do that. Yeah, that's good feedback. We'll, we'll take that into consideration. We also do record these meetings, too, as you know, so we, we try to be helpful like that, too, but that's right. good to know. Thanks okay. for that. It's a, okay, all right. A so let me get to the, the, the substantive things I wanted to say about it. Um, I was I was a little dismayed to see in this issue paper um, a topic that was of huge discussion and concern in the hybrid resources initiative, which is in particular for co-located resources, um, more so than hybrid resources, but in general, um, how to manage, uh, how to control the need for grid charging and limit grid charging in the in the IPC recovery period for co-located resources. You're having there's some really dysfunctional things developing, and I, I don't know if you know this, but there are a lot of PTAs being signed that simply prohibit grid charging, and there are people designing facilities to make it physically impossible for them to charge from the grid for the first five years because they are so concerned about losing those tax credits. And I thought that we, that, that Pekaiso had said that, those, that, that that issue could be discussed further in this initiative, which, by the way, we're really happy to see this so soon, but... If there's, I, I really think it, it, it is such a big issue. It continues to be a huge issue. And if you want to head off weird things like people disabling their grid charging because they can't lift mm -hmm. the ITC, then I think you really should address that here. Yeah, Susan, I, I, I think you're right. I think at the very least that's worth, you know, spilling some ink and, and sort of reviewing what the issues are and, and you know, believe me, the ISO and me specifically are aware of what's going on with some of these contracts, and um, some of it is a little bit frustrating for us things. because yeah. the ad additional functionality. Um, but I think you're right. We are going to need the right market mechanisms in place to address this. Um, so I can promise you that we will talk, you know, and please include this in your written comments as always. Um, sure. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, but I, I, I do think I, I can promise you that we will spend still some ink on this in the straw proposal. Um, I did want to explore some solutions in the uh, resource adequacy enhancements paper, uh, but you know there might be some crossover here with this initiative, or you might be right. It might just be better to address these issues here. Um, so I think with uh, the iteration of this issue paper and the first straw proposal, let's start to um, think about what kind of solutions might work for the storage fleet uh, in order to accommodate this. And then from the ISO perspective, we can think about how to put together a proposal to accommodate that. Um, and then we can think specifically about where that proposal should live and how all the rules should work out with uh, resource adequacy and that sort of thing. Yeah, it would be Does great if you didn't have to do play whack-a-mole on this one, continue to play whack-a-mole yeah. on this one. Um, so, you know, yeah, that could be a clear decision about what the home is. Yep. Yeah. That would be helpful. 
Okay. And I, and, and so because you do have a huge amount of, of resources coming online because of the batch MMA process that are, that are, uh, the CPC said that are coming online in conjunction with, uh, with generation. And it, it just would really behoove you if you don't want to start seeing weird stuff like people disabling what would otherwise be maybe a useful tool for the CAISO, um, and, and limiting the usage, use of storage and the usefulness of it. To, to really try and address that issue and give people some confidence they can control that grid charging um, as they choose or as they need to. Yep. I, I appreciate that feedback, Susan, and, and we'll, we'll think about these issues and, you know, start to address them. Okay, thanks. Well, we do have a few more questions here. Um, Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi guys, this is Mike Castellano from Energy Division of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, first, I wanted to just make a quick note. The questions you read earlier from the CPUC were from the Public Advocates Office. Um, so if anybody's curious about those, I, I did not write those. Uh, the guys over at CalPA sent those in. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I clarified um, that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I guess, Gabe, I still think, you know, the, the biggest issue with energy storage and how it works in your market is that you're only viewing one, in the real time, you're only viewing one part of a transaction that's a two-part transaction. Um, and, you know, I, I did see that in the issue paper, you guys um, basically outlawed the idea of extending the real time market. Um, and I, I'm very curious about that. I, I guess my main thing there would be I'd like to know what the most you can do is. You said you can't do it for, like, you can't do RTD for eight hours, but could you do FMM for six or eight hours and, you know, pass those results to RTD, sort of like a resource commitment or something like that. But just talking about the issue, if you're only modeling sort of the charging or the discharging at any given time in the market, it's sort of like you're running one of the EIM BAAs on its own and just making plans like, oh, we're going to put this much energy into transfer, and we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what's going to happen to it, but we think this is probably the right amount, um, and we're going to, mm -hmm. you know, we're sort of making the market participant guess what that right amount is without knowing what's going to be on the other side and what the need's going to be. And obviously, mm -hmm. it's just going to be so much more efficient if you can model both sides of that transaction. And I think we at the CPUC, or we in Energy Division, we're really, really hoping that this initiative was going to be sort of a fresh look at what the market could be and how we could get to the point where we're modeling both sides of those transactions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I still want to put the ask out there that sort of that's where I think the biggest issue is. And, you know, can we get to a point in some initiative sometime soon where we're actually looking at how and when that might be possible? Because right now the way we're building the fleet, it's looking like we're going to be mostly renewables and storage and, mm -hmm. you know, we need to start thinking about how that's really going to work and how you guys are going to be able to run that. Like, I, I, I just yeah, really honestly I, think that's where progress is going to be made, and there's no, you know, there's very limited progress made um, in sort of delaying that. Yeah. So, Mike, I don't, you know, I, I know we're sort of getting a, a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Um, you know, I, I certainly appreciate the fact that, well, I, I would say if I had my way, I would also want to think about ways to extend the real-time market so that, you know, and, and specifically the RTM five-minute market, so that instead of just focusing on period, we could see the entire window from when we were going to be charging these resources to when we were going to be discharging the resources. I see the value in that. Um, I am assured, and, and this has gone all the way up through um, Colette, our Vice President of Technology, um, that that cannot be accommodated uh, as a technological solution at this time. And I don't think we have a specific answer about 
how much we could potentially expand the real-time market, the RTD market. Um, but I'm told that it, it probably wouldn't be very much beyond an hour. Um, so it wouldn't be sufficient to see the periods where we want to be charging and discharging the resources. Um, you know, we have... Okay, so Gabe, do you know, is this, is this a limitation from the CAISO or is this something that Siemens is giving you guys? My understanding, um, not knowing all the ins and outs of how the software works, is that this is a software limitation that's based on solution times to the, you know, cost minimization problem to solve the market. Right. Okay. Um, now, in the paper, and, and again, we're getting a, a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but in the paper, we have sort of explored three different ideas about how to, you know, how to procure the quote unquote, the right amount of state of charge earlier in the day through the RTD market. And I think internally, at least, what we're thinking about is using results from the day ahead market similar to more or less how we're doing the minimum state of charge requirement today. But then we're also thinking about how we can update those estimates of how much state of charge we're going to need from the storage fleet in the real-time market, and I, I mean, I don't, you know, that obviously isn't the same as having a cost minimization solution for charging and discharging storage resources, but what it does do is it puts constraints on the real-time market that you're trying to solve that we would hope result in a solution that's going to be closer, uh, well, hopefully a heck of a lot closer than what you would do if you would just run your ordinary RTD market. So I think, you know, we would be interested in conversing with you about the solution, you know, as we move forward with I any of these three solutions, about what your thoughts are on the efficiency of these and how we could use these constraints or other constraints to potentially get our RTD market that we have and we're running closer to that ideal solution that, that I think we both have in mind. All right, yeah, I'm, you know, always happy to talk with you guys about this. Um, as I was, you know, a few weeks ago when I yep. when I made the offer to talk with you about this. Um, so you know how to get a hold of me. Oh, well, thank you, Mike, I appreciate it. And we do have a few other questions here. Hi, your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, Gabe. This is Callie Wells with WPTF. Um, for, I guess, sake of time, I'll keep this short. Um, I just wanted to voice our appreciation that you guys have kept the scope of this initiative open at this point, um, as well as the schedule. I think there's obviously sometimes that doesn't always bode well when we have a predetermined scope and issues pop up as we're having discussions. So again, really appreciate that. Um, really intrigued by your guys being open to considering more, um, fundamental changes. And I think Mike, um, I agree with what Mike said that I think we need to take this opportunity to kind of look at some holistic changes um, to kind of see, you know, maybe it's a better fit that we redesign some of the market um, elements for storage rather than kind of addressing these little one-off issues. Um, there might be kind of a, a better holistic approach there. So. Um, I guess my question is, have you guys kind of thought through the logistics on how those conversations would be coordinated? Or um, are you thinking maybe some workshops up front that kind of start this bigger picture conversation at the same time you're addressing those issues that are in, um, that you guys have laid out, as well as others that stakeholders um, bring up? Or, you know, kind of, have you thought through that process yet? Yeah, Kelly, I think that's a really great question. Um, what I am anticipating doing is, you know, taking a long look at the written comments that we get from our discussion today and obviously the, the conversation that we're having right now um, and, and reading through what the suggestions are. I agree with you if we get a lot of comments that say, hey, look, um, I think a holistic market change is warranted and now is the right time to do it 
and here's some ideas about how, you know, how and we might go about making that change, and here's the direction I'd like to see the ISO take. And then, I, you know, I think, too, we, we have to be able to have some certainty around our, you know, technological capability to be able to implement solutions like that. But in the event that these, these ideas seem feasible and we want to explore them more, um, I, I, I see the ISO moving forward with a straw proposal in the next phase of this iteration, in the next iteration of this policy. And then if we do need to dive into the details of how to actually implement some of these solutions, you know, working groups might be the way to go on that as we could get a, a large group in the same room virtually and um, work through some of these details. Is that okay. sort of aligned with what you're thinking? Yeah, I appreciate it. I guess one suggestion is, um, I don't know, kind of schedule-wise, obviously, because it hasn't been laid out yet, and again, appreciate that, um, but there's not a, a strict timeline we're having to adhere to at this point. But in the next draft proposal, if, if you get a lot of comments that come back that say, you know, we need to look at some more fundamental changes um, that maybe the, the workshops come prior to a draft proposal, because I know we've done that in the past with other policies that looked at kind of bigger picture changes. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just that suggestion. Um, and my other comment or question I was going to have, I'm going to defer until you got to that section, but since Mike brought up the, the extended outlook horizon, um, I, I know you guys have said that it's not technologically feasible at this point, but there's always a, a price that comes with, you know, you can always buy more computing power if that's the, you know, if that's the, the binding constraint at this point. So I think we would like to see, you know, what is that cost? because um, there's always, you know, a cost-benefit analysis there, and, and if the cost of buying the computing power so that the outlook horizon can be extended, you know, the benefit might outweigh that cost. Um, so we would really appreciate some some more data on on that cost, um, either, you know, in the next iteration of, of the paper, um, just so we can all kind of do that cost-benefit analysis, because it might be worth it. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, I will bring that question up specifically to our technology team and um, see what they say. But I, I would just say that, you know, I, I've certainly broached this topic with them, and I know other members of senior management have, have brought this topic up um, and asked seriously about what kind of solutions technology can provide. And I, I think the feedback is very similar to the feedback that I just gave Mike in that, at this point, it really isn't technologically feasible. Um, but, you know, what, like you said, uh, technology is developing. Things are changing all the time. So, you know, as we get more computing power, more resources, you know, it's possible that that answer changes. But I, I will relay that um, ask on to our technology team. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I emphasize, you know, that, you know, you have the ability of buying more computing power. Um, I'm not an IT person. I'm not going to claim to be. But it seems to me like that there's a dollar, there's a cost today that we could actually get that capability. So what is that cost, um, I guess, is our ask. Okay. So thank you. Yep, I understand. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And we do have another question here. Hi, your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Good morning, Gabe. Uh, this is Aldous Boboda over at PG&E. Um, I had uh, just one um, general comment about the process I wanted to, to just raise as a possibility. It seems to me that some of the comments that were made as, as well as the the different suggestions that are made in the issue paper are essentially uh, not necessarily all going to be on the same timeline. And it might be worth thinking about this more along the lines of how the ISO has done its, its uh, um, roadmap process in the past and maybe having more of a uh, capability for participants to, in, in a sense, vote on what is most important to them and, and essentially get a ranking of, of different changes. Because I, I, I think a lot of these, um, you know, we, we, see, we see a lot of the same issues uh, coming up uh, and um, would like to contribute to those, but, but there's certainly a, a need to understand what would be done first. Um, you know, versus what might require quite a, a lot more time to get to. I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to your, uh, to your and um, and the uh, vendors' issues with trying to solve a, a, a problem with a, a lot of uh, 
integer variables. I don't think it's just a matter of computing power. It's at a certain point, you have to reformulate the problem, and that's not a, you know, a mechanical process. But um, but I think those things should all be put on the on on kind of the roadmap, and then and then uh, essentially get some uh, general uh, sort of sense of of which are the most important to different market participants. Um, so yeah, just I think a, that's oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, the the other comment, just quickly, is just one thing that we're concerned about that we and we just wanted to to raise as a more immediate issue for. Um, this initiative is we have a, a, a grave concerns with how the uh, OMS system uh, is constructed right now for our, our ability to um, deal with dynamic uh, clearances on, uh, mm -hmm. on batteries. And we feel that's such an issue that it should actually be part of this initiative unless there's – because from what we understand, there is no guarantee that it can be really handled mm -hmm. um, otherwise. So I just wanted to raise that as another uh, another thing on the laundry list of of uh, of, yeah. on, of your roadmap. So thank you, Gabe. So we yeah we appreciate that feedback, Alva. Um, I I really hope to ha you know as we get feedback through this process um, from the issue paper, I'm hoping to collate a list of the issues and ideally. You know, if, if these are all things that we can tackle through the normal sort of stakeholder process and, and come up with a hopefully relatively soon delivery date for these things, um, I think that would be the best case scenario. I do agree with you, though, if we start thinking more seriously about these holistic market changes, um, that obviously is a lot more uh, complex process and would, would take a lot more time to actually, you know, thoroughly vet and implement eventually. So, um, you know, hopefully in the next version of the paper, we have a little bit more sense of clarity about, you know, what solutions are out there, what we should be exploring or not exploring in this initiative, and then, and then with that list of, of potential policy issues, you know, where does the ISO want to go and, and sort of what is the time frame for potentially implementing those. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have a lot more information about that the next iteration of, the, of, of this initiative. Um, as far as the, the outage issues, yes, please include that in your written comments, and um, I, I'd love to put that on the laundry list. Uh, it seems like uh, I agree with you, something that we've heard a lot of issues about and likely should be addressed through this policy or some other policy. Great. Thank you, Gabe. Yep. We do have about three more questions here. I'm just going to meet you the next one. Please go ahead. Um, hello, this is uh, Kathleen Colbert um, from Vistra. Can you hear me? I can. Good morning, Kathleen. Good morning. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Gabe. And thanks, I want to say thank you, Jimmy and Gabe, for putting this together and starting this conversation. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, a, it's a good Wednesday activity halfway through the week. Um, I... Uh, so I wanted to actually maybe go back, if you don't mind, if we could go back to slide five. I wanted to flag for for the for the Kaiso and for others on a call, kind of one other. I, you went through kind of a, a, the, the reiteration of, of the issues as you, at least the kind of the initial problem statement, but not the specific issues which we're going to mm -hmm. work on outlining through our comments. But I wanted to flag one more. So, and it's a very general one, and, and I'm going to keep my feedback right now up at like 100,000 foot level, if that's cool. Um, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so for context, Vistra has brought online 300 megawatts of um, battery, ener battery energy storage so far this year, and we plan to bring another 100 megawatts. That's roughly 1,600 megawatt hours on the system at the same um, point of interconnection. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that you're, you know, flagging there's new technologies. This is a lithium ion. It's, just, it's kind of a conventional technology that that is most of what is being built out. So it doesn't fall into that bucket of, I think, when you were talking through, there may be new technologies that raise different challenges for the non-generator resource model. Um, but I wanted to flag that, in my mind, I have questions about really m more stress testing, finding the breakpoints. Um, with the size of the build-out that we're expecting, 
this year, last starting last year, really this year and on, and, and I highlight like at this one point of interconnection uh, with injections into the KISO controlled grid of 400 megawatts, 1600 megawatt hours, that is a, a significantly larger injection than I believe the NGRI model has had to support um, within the market construct today. And one of my, one of the things that I'm really interested, well, maybe interested is a bad word, but I'm trying to look forward to seeing is with that size, does it find kind of the edge cases within our existing framework? So rather than kind of like this holistic, I appreciate all the holistic things that were being raised, but I do wonder is there, is there any, you know, are there any points of uh, tension within the existing framework just from the sheer amount that will be participating? Um, before I move on, does that make sense to you? Yeah, the question makes sense. Um, I may kick this over uh, to Deb Levine, who's on the call. I, I think she's on the call, um, and she may be able to speak to our current process on this. Yeah, before you kick it over to Deb, I would clarify, when I say that, I really mean the, the market application system, but yeah, please. Oh, hmm, okay. I'm talking, yeah, I'm literally yeah. talking about the That's market itself key. and the, yeah. Uh, what I can offer, though, so I'm posing this very high level. This is my high level concern. Like I said, we have brought on 400 megawatts, 1,600. Well, we will have 400 soon, uh, 1,600 megawatt hours. And with that, with that, we can start to really see. And I know we're not the only ones. Other people are exiting the queue and, and reaching commercial. I think that is something that Deb can help um, help size what that looks like uh, for this summer. What I think we will start to see is if there are any of these tension points, we're going to start to see them soon. Um, and so, my, my, mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I'm a little bit confused. What, what's the actual issue that you're seeing or concerned about seeing? So what I'm, okay, so yes, let me reiterate, is that I'm not bringing up any specific issue with the market right now, because at this point, huh. I don't believe that we really are having so my understanding is that the additional, like we have brought on some megawatts, we're still looking into it, and I'm not ready to bring those issues forward. So what the is, so I think more of the process issue I'm, ra I'm raising or trying to raise, um, in addition to just the conceptual one of large megawatts participating in the NGR model that have not to date, anytime you add size to the model, you increase mm -hmm. the probability that something that was, that when it was built or designed, some particular edge case, that's what I'm saying, edge case, tension points, was not contemplated, or it was contemplated, but truly was only going to optimally function at lower penetration levels. That's not something that we will see until, I think, next month. And with addition, and that when I say next month, that's, that's also because I think other resources are coming online in addition to ours. And so I think we're gonna to start to have the opportunity to identify other issues, but it won't be necessarily in time for these comments. So I- Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what um, I mean. I think we want to hear the issues that are facing storage resources today, um, you know, to the extent that you are anticipating issues, I think, We'd like to hear about those so we can start exploring them. Um, as you know, issue, yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely correct. You know, we're going from a system where we're operating 600 megawatts of storage today to one where we're going to be operating potentially up to 2,000 megawatts this summer. Um, there likely could be a lot of new issues that are unearthed in that time. To the extent that there are, you know, we certainly want to keep the feedback loop open. Um, and to the extent we can accommodate those issues in this process, we will. But, I, you know, I, I appreciate that, and I think that's um, on point with, with what we want to do in this stakeholder process. That's great, Gabe. Um, what my request, and I, I floated this, I think, through a couple other people, but I wanted to raise it on the call, put it in our written comments, is that um, Echo Cali's request for a workshop, I will refine the request that in my mind is kind of more along the lines of what Alva was suggesting. Let's get together, um, you know, kind of 
go through the inventory of issues that have been raised and, and talk through them and provide market participant experience with them. And we can do that in real time. Um, and if we, you can schedule a workshop that is, is kind of tailored to more of, 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 a, of, of a practical discussion of the issues, um, I would be willing to mm -hmm. try and bring on some of um, Vistra's traders who have the actual, you know, interface with these issues to provide that additional context. And that's an offer I'm, I'm happy to make um, to help the TISO okay. in this. But it, I mean, that 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 venue would would provide that opportunity for us to do that. And I um, want to make that request. And I think just for also in the light of I think we're going to learn more through June, um, if it could be towards the end of June. Um, or beginning of July and save time for us to go through those issues, that would be that would be really great. And that um, is what we'd like to ask the guys to consider. So thank you so much. That's a great offer. Thank you, Kathleen. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, Jimmy, I know we have a couple questions in the chat queue. I think we should take those questions and then we'll move on to the list of the real-time issues. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Fuzz. We are receiving more questions than anticipated, so probably best to move on as Gabe ended for time. And uh, maybe your question will be addressed as we do move on. But yeah, as Gabe noted, a couple in the chat that came in over the course of the past few minutes. Uh, one from, I see Drew from Fluence Energy asks, uh, storage resources can experience degradation when they sit extremely high or low states of charge. However, this behavior can be valuable to the grid. It doesn't look like any of the proposed changes address this. Are there any plans to help resources directly account for these costs? Yeah, Drew, um, I, I think that's a good comment. I, you know, um, like I said, I, I don't think we've written a, you know, necessarily complete list of every issue that could, um, you know, that a storage resource could experience. Um, this is an issue and we've heard about this issue um, so to the extent that this is an issue for others as well, um, I'd like to hear about it in comments. And uh, again, if we do get sort of groundswell around this, I think we could, you know, specifically spend some time in this policy thinking about solutions to that problem. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up, and I'd encourage anyone who's experiencing that or thinks that this, that's a high priority problem to include that in comments. Great. We also have a question from. Michael Bohan, and as a reminder, folks, uh, please identify the company that you're with if you can. We appreciate that. Michael's asking, currently it's not possible to offer uh, AS on any kind of curve. I guess it's more of a comment, so I appreciate that. So he's noting some storage is not indifferent to different quantities and combinations of AS. We would like the Kaiser to consider adding the ability to bid AS on curves. So thanks for that comment, Michael. Yeah, just, uh, I don't know, Gabe. Yeah. Just a note on that very quickly before we move on. Something like that might be better accommodated in a different stakeholder initiative. I think that's a little bit more general to all resources in the market and not necessarily specific to storage. Um, but I think, again, if, if that's something that storage resources are really seeing a desire for, you know, we'd like to hear about it here and we could potentially escalate it to those other um, venues to talk about. But I appreciate the comment. Great. We also have a comment from uh, Chinmay, Chinmay Vad. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I asked, does the initiative cover the uh, BESS resources that are scheduled dynamically into the KISO market and are outside of the KISO balancing area? So, you know, to the extent that storage resources are pseudotied into uh, the ISO market or as modeled as storage resources in the ISO market, even though they're, they're outside of the ISO market physically, then the storage rules that apply to the model would be applicable to those resources. Um, you know, if, if you've just simply got a storage resource that's sitting outside of the ISO and you're scheduling energy uh, in or out of the ISO to the battery, um, those resources may not be uh, you know, the, the same rules may not apply to those resources. Thank you, Gabe. And last written question that I see from Doug Boccioni. Hey, Doug, I believe you're still a Flynn Resource Consultant. Sorry if I got that wrong, but trying to identify the company for folks. Uh, if Doug, Doug's asking if the real-time 
market horizon cannot be extended such that it, it explicitly captures charging or discharging opportunity costs? How will the CAIPS operators make decisions about when they should dispatch the storage resources procured in the forward market? And how will the associated impact of what will essentially be out-of-market dispatches, i.e. not explicitly priced by the market, be addressed? Yeah, I, I think Doug, this is this is the million dollar question, right? You know, ideally, you know, as Mike and I were discussing earlier, we'd like to have a market model that, you know, has the look ahead capability to say, oh, you know, I need to start charging resources right now because I'm going to need to discharge them six, seven, eight hours from now, um, and I know I need a heck of a lot of um, energy. A market that works that way you know, can come up with an efficient solution and it can sort of come up with the right dispatch for storage resources and, and it's going to ensure reliability. With the market that we have right now that's only looking out an hour ahead, and, and I'm thinking specifically about the RTD market, you know, it, it doesn't have the capability to, to do that advanced look ahead. So the solution that we're thinking about is putting constraints on the real-time market or procuring an additional state of charge product, and we'll get into this later in the presentation. Um, but that solution, you know, is going to be suboptimal because you're you're, basic, you're you're basically imposing an additional constraint on the real time market, and you're not doing that look ahead process and letting the market optimization figure out what you need. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. This is the question that we need to be addressing in the policy. And as we go forward with the proposal, I'd like to hear more feedback on how we could get those assumptions and those constraints in the real-time market, and, you know, do the best job we can at formulating those. Okay, any other questions in the chat, Jimmy? Thanks, Gabe. I don't see any more. And if I miss any, I'll circle back, of course. But for the sake of time, like we mentioned, folks, please say if you can. So go ahead, Gabe. That's yeah. great. Yeah, let's. I, I think you're right. Let's continue to address the um, chat questions first and then get to the phone questions. Um, but with that, we can move on to um, the real-time uh, issues. And for that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bridget Sparks. Thanks, Gabe. Um, good morning, everyone. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, so these next set of issues uh, have been brought up in both the ESDER initiative and also when we were developing um, the minimum city of charge requirement through RE enhancements. Um, and so these are some issues that market participants have continued to raise um, and some of the feedback we've heard around possible changes. So to begin uh, with the multi-interval optimization and spread bidding. So today, the real-time market dispatches all resources based on future expected market conditions as represented through the binding and advisory intervals in the lookout horizon. And so this multi-interval optimization is effective at positioning the system to meet um, anticipated demand, as well as increasing overall market efficiency to reduce uplift payments, which saves ratepayers money. Um, the optimization can issue startup shutdown and dispatch instructions based on future conditions, again, to help the system meet uh, anticipated demand. The market minimizes costs during the binding and advisory interval. And so for storage resources, uh, when they look at the um, binding interval, it may look inconsistent with their bids. Um, but if you look out over the full um, optimization horizon, uh, the market tends to minimize costs overall. And so from a larger view, uh, this dispatch is actually uh, economic, even though from the individual resource perspective, it may appear inconsistent with bids. Additionally, if a storage resource has a self-schedule or exceptional dispatch to discharge, the resource will be charged uh, in anticipation of the schedule. Uh, we also see this in the reverse, where if a resource has a self-schedule to um, charge or an exceptional dispatch to charge, uh, the market may um, discharge the resource in order to create headroom um, to meet that um, future schedule. Next slide. So the feedback we've heard from stakeholders is uh, a desire to either reduce or eliminate the advisory intervals in the real-time market that are considered for storage resources. 
So what we've heard is that um, folks think that the, um, in the real-time market in RTD, we have one binding interval and 12 um, five-minute lookout advisory intervals. And so if the market sees anticipated price spikes in one of these advisory intervals, it could dispatch the resource to charge in order to have energy to discharge to capture these expected price spikes. Um, but as you move forward in time, um, conditions can change, and so you may not actually realize those anticipated price spikes. And so whereas the cost recovery can um, help um, recover any um, revenue shortfalls from this, um, stakeholders have still suggested reducing the influence advisory intervals to limit um, this from happening because um, there is potential additional wear and tear on resources if they are um, cycled too frequently, and so today, um, we may not have the tools to accurately represent these costs. And so one way we could possibly um, address this issue is again by reducing the influence of advisory intervals and have the market dispatched based on um, the single binding interval and whether it is um, within their um, bid spread. Uh, relatedly, we've also heard that um, the real-time market should only consider specific dollar thresholds rather than the implied spread between bids. So the way that storage resources can bid into the market is they have um, one bid curve to um, charge the resource and another bid curve to discharge the resource and there's an implied spread between those. So say someone bid in uh, $15 to charge and will discharge um, at $65. So there's an implied $50 spread. And so sometimes uh, the market may dispatch the resource um, when it sees a similar $50 price spread. Um, however, in most instances, it does dispatch based on um, the discrete bid prices, um, but there's still a desire to sort of explore whether or not um, this implied spread bidding um, should be utilized in the uh, real-time market. Next slide. Another issue we've heard is that because the real-time market has such a short lookout horizon, um, anywhere from 65 minutes in the RTD market up to two hours in the 15-minute market, um, the market may not be able to see um, the optimal times to charge or discharge based on um, prices outside of this time horizon. And so there's no way to explicitly measure, to represent um, the future value of this energy. And so one suggestion to uh, accommodate this is to explicitly have a end of horizon opportunity cost bid um, that could help the market um, save state of charge for use later in the day when selling opportunities may be greater. Um, so one suggestion, again, is to allow storage resources to explicitly um, submit an end of horizon um, cost in their submitted bids um, to represent the monetary value of the stored energy in later intervals, which is one another way to possibly address the limited lookout horizon um, that you may not be able to see, um, again, these expected future prices. Next slide. Relatedly, so good cost recovery provides compensation for net revenue shortfalls across the entire day. So in instances where um, the market dispatches a resource um, outside of their bid curve, um, there is an opportunity to um, compensate these resources for any revenue shortfalls um, that may result. So in the day ahead um, market, the um, BCR is settled separately from the real-time market. And for storage resources, unlike other resources, they only have energy costs and do not have startup costs, minimum load costs, or transition costs that are included in the bid cost recovery settlement. Um, so really, the costs for, re for storage resources are driven by their energy bid costs. And so we've heard um, suggestions on possible modifications to how bid cost recovery rules are set up for storage. And so one thing to keep in mind is that um, changes to bid cost recovery may be less necessary if uh, storage resources are given additional tools to better represent their costs to the market, um, which would help the dispatch um, position these resources such that they could cover their costs. 
Um, however, some suggestions we have heard around how we might think about redesigning bid cost recovery for storage resources is to, rather than looking at this as a 24-hour um, settlement, to net cost and revenues across the charge and discharge cycle of the resource. So since we mostly have four-hour duration lithium-ion batteries, um, this would be netting these costs across an eight to nine hour period to represent the cycle of charging and discharging rather than um, a 24 hour period. So if you had multiple cycles in the day, you might have multiple bid cost recovery periods that represent each of these charge and discharge cycles. Um, again, another suggestion we've heard is that rather than looking at the um, specific five minute interval um, LMP versus bid um, across the whole day, rather looking and settling to make sure that the total cost of charge and the total cost of discharge over the day, that the um, difference between those two quantities is enough to uncover the implied spread um, between the bid to charge and bid to discharge. Um, so again, rather than looking at LMP versus bid in that interval, it's a more holistic look to look at um, the entire cost to buy the energy and what it was sold for and whether or not um, the difference between those covers the spread as represented in the bid. Um, so I believe that's the last slide in this section on um, some of the issues you've heard uh, related to the real-time market. Um, so I will pause here for questions. Thank you, Bridget. I don't see anything in the chat. The operator, I'm not sure if there's anything in the queue. We do have a few questions in the queue. Would you like to say something? Yes, please. While well, your line has been unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, this is Lisa Bro with EDF Renewables. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. And I'm sorry, these are a couple of comments from the previous section. <laughs> sorry about that. But, um, I just wanted to sort of add first to the chorus of interest on taking a look at what it might take for extending the real-time market um, capabilities. It's somewhat unsatisfying just to hear, well, we're under instruction, we can't do it. Um, if there's some way maybe I'd like to recommend like a one-pager on technical capabilities, I echo WPTF comments on it would be great to sort of map out costs associated with an upgrade of sorts. Um, and, and perhaps at that point, we do sort of take a look at the cost benefit and, and all collectively try to make an informed decision. But again, it is unsatisfying to just hear we can't do it. Um, so a note on that. And then I'll just throw out, and I don't want us to expand too much on it, but as something we're thinking about as a piece for this initiative is potentially um, a solution simplifying power. So as I said, we don't have to elaborate too much on it. I just wanted to throw that out there that we'll put that in our comments and, and as something we'd like to dig into as part of this initiative. Thanks. Great. Thank you for those comments. And we do have a few other questions here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Sergio Luñez with the California Energy Storage Alliance. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, you can. So I had a, uh, thanks. I had a couple of questions, um, mainly related to how the ISO thinks this uh, real-time issues should be addressed. Uh, it seems to me from reading the issue paper that right now we don't have uh, among the issues that are described, a form of uh, prioritization of the different topics. Um, but something I do get the sense of uh, in the paper is that um, most of the issues are either tangentially or completely related to the minimum state of charge requirement discussions that we had in our enhancements. Um, from our perspective, um, Working uh, on the issues of big cost recovery and the MIO tool and, and how it 
potentially sends uh, either undesirable or or incorrect uh, dispatch instructions based on bid spreads and the advisory intervals. We think that if the ISO were to address those issues perhaps first, perhaps first we'd be in a better position to transition away from the MSOC, uh, which has this sunset period of, of two years. Um, my question is, do you guys think that there should be um, some form of stakeholder uh, process to have a prioritization list on different topics? Uh, if so, do you think this could be uh, achieved through different phases of the initiative, thinking perhaps the first phase uh, relates very directly to what are we going to do with the MSOC, uh, and other phases may relate more broadly to you know the the amount of storage that will come into, perhaps as it was mentioned previously uh, by by other uh, stakeholders, if we see any other um, holistic issues coming uh, from from the storage joining, or do you see all of this as something that should be worked in parallel uh, with, a, with a single implementation uh, goal or, or target? Hey, Sergio, this is Gabe. So th thanks for that question. Um, I, I think it is important, and I think it's related to some of the discussion that we've had earlier. Um, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that you know, there's a lot of interdependencies between all of the issues that we've outlined here in this presentation. And, you know, thinking about and generating a really good solution for one of them, like the minimum state of charge, might automatically mean you're solving some of these other problems. Um, so I think to the extent that we can address multiple problems with one or perhaps two or three, solutions, I think the ISO would be very eager to do that. And like I mentioned, I think, you know, we're, we're definitely trying to get the best solution we can out of this process for, for as many of these problems as we can. Um, but I think the, the start of the conversation was more geared towards, well, maybe there's something that we can do um, to sort of revamp the market. And I, I tend to agree with you. If we're going to go down the road of exploring how to revamp the market, that could be a very in-depth process, and it certainly, you know, probably, you know, almost certainly won't take the same amount of time that a solution for just simply replacing the minimum state of charge requirement would be. Now, with that in mind, I, I think you're right. One of the ISO's goals and one of our top priorities is to find a replacement tool for the minimum state of charge requirement. And I think that can certainly be tackled, you know, as early as possible with some of these other issues. Um, to the extent we find we're working on some of what could be larger issues that might take more time to develop, you know, we certainly can, you know, scope that into the project and, and think about how to do timing for that. I think right now, um, you know, we're certainly going to be focused on replacement tools for the minimum state of charge. We might be focused on some of these other real-time issues. Um, and I think we're certainly open to the idea of starting to explore, you know, some of these more holistic changes, and then we can look at uh, timing on how they all fit together. Does that help? Yeah, that does help, Gabe. And um, just to share a bit of our perspective on this, we do think that while it's important to find what we're going to replace the minimum state of charge requirement with, and the paper sort of highlights two alternatives that could be adopted. Uh, you know, this uh, either having an energy shifting product or this biddable uh, product. Um, we also think that addressing issues in real time, such as bid cost recovery, MIO, and spread bidding, could result in no longer needing a replacement for the, the MSOC. Uh, I guess that's sort of where I was going as well. Uh, I don't think that it's unnecessary for us uh, to think ahead, obviously, uh, but it is, it is possible that hey, if we have big cost recovery that works for energy storage, then we can compensate storage for an application of something like the MSOC. 
if we minimize uh, the possibility of having uh, inefficient dispatches based on bid spreads rather than the, the cost points used, and we allow storage to have bid curves depending on the state of charge, maybe we'll be, you know, in, in the outcome, well, way less likely to be in the situation where storage runs out of, of state of charge prior to, you know, um, the net load peak or the ramping period. Um, so I guess uh, we're, we're, what I'm trying to communicate here is I think these topics are very important. These are topics that we unfortunately had to run through in our enhancements. But now that we have the opportunity, fixing something like this could potentially obviate the need for something like the NSOC. Yeah, I, I think we agree. And, you know, we want to keep our fingers on the pulse on where we can get those synergies, if you will, from development across this policy. So, you know, it's going to take continued engagement um, from us and from the stakeholder community to come up with those solutions and, and you know, try, like, like you say, try to deliver the best solution we can that hopefully solves, you know, multiple of these problems. But I appreciate the feedback, um, Sergio. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gabe. Well, we do have a few other questions here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. It's Mike Castellano from uh, CPUC staff again. I uh, just had a couple quick comments. Um, so, Bridget, going back to the BCR question, I think the right thing to do is just to make sure that you're counting the costs for an amount of energy that is equal to, you know, accounting for losses and stuff that is equal to the amount of energy you're counting the revenue for. Um, and I think you can do that on whatever, you could probably do that on a daily cycle as long as you have some tracking sort of backward into when the energy was charged and potentially cutting off some of the energy that if, you know, the batteries or storage resources charging in the last two hours of the day, you don't want to include that in the daily calculation. Um, on some of this other stuff, though, like the, the lack of interest in spread bidding and the desire to get out of the multi-interval optimization, I think the real solution to those is um, you know, an extended outlook with some changes in settlement so that settlement and BCR so that uh, you're, you know, made whole for part of the plans. You know, if you're being charged at what's seen as relatively low price and then, you know, the discharge prices change, you can still be discharged at some time and made whole for the the difference there. When I hear people saying that they don't want to get involved in you know, ensuring their profits and instead want to be able to make sure they're selling at a specific price point, that sounds like, I mean, honestly, it sounds like cross-product manipulation. Um, if somebody was doing that when I had worked in market monitoring, I have a feeling I'd be asked to investigate that. Um, and it just sounds really shady to me. So I just want to make sure that I raise that alarm um, because it, it doesn't sound reasonable at all from an economic standpoint. Yeah, thanks, Mike. We appreciate um, those comments. And um, I think our perspective was this question around, we keep hearing that there's, you know, desire to limit the number of advisory intervals or that spread bidding is causing issues. And um, internally we sort of discussed if this is more so a symptom of not being able to accurately represent costs. Um, and so the market may be um, dispatching resources without, you know, sort of a full picture. And so um, when it comes time to settle, resources feel like they're, you know, not getting sufficient revenues because, you know, they may not be recovering their uh, full cost to operate. Um, and so I think, you know, that's in the paper we talk more about, you know, this is what we keep hearing, but, you know, is this more symptomatic of this other issue around not being able to accurately model costs and so provide a few, um, you know, suggestions around how 
we might give additional bidding parameters to help resources um, model this so that, you know, the multi-interval optimization um, is better able to um, dispatch in accordance with their true costs. Um, and so um, I definitely think we're, um, you know, still investigating claims around, you know, spread bidding really causing issues or not, you know, dispatching um, resources economically. Um, and so I think we are, you know, similarly, um, suspicious isn't the right word, but, you know, want to investigate more the root cause of that suggestion. Um, so we definitely, um, you know, have a note down um, to be a little bit more wary of that suggestion. And so we appreciate that comment. And then um, I get your point around um, BCR focusing more on quantity of energy um, that's charged and then sold later rather than some sort of hour. Um, and so I, I have that down. Um, so thanks for those comments. We do have a few other questions here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, Bridget. This is Callie Wells with WPTF again. Um, I wanted to go back on a comment you made on slide nine just so I can make sure I understand what you were saying. So regarding the second bullet where um, the real-time market should only consider specific dollar thresholds rather than spread bids. Did I hear you correct that when you guys looked into this, you're actually seeing the market primarily dispatch based on the specific dollar thresholds and not the spread bids? Yeah, that's correct. So um, what we tend to observe is that um, only when the um, – of charge constraints are binding, does the market really consider um, the spread bids? Um, but more often than not, it's dispatching resources to charge if LMPs are at or below their bids um, to charge and then discharge um, at or above their bid to um, discharge. So it's only in sort of Living circumstances, especially when they're at really low states of charge, um, does the market really start um, using the implied spread? So we're still uh, digging into that um, more and looking at, you know, what circumstances the spread bids really come into play. Um, but what we've investigated so far seems to show that more often than not, it really is um, looking at the discrete prices um, rather than the implied spread between them. Okay, I appreciate that additional context. I'm just curious when you guys uh, look into this a little bit more, I'm wondering if it's just a matter of what bids are being submitted into the market that it just happens to be working out that way versus maybe, and I don't know if you guys could test this maybe a map stage somehow, but um, if it's still that case, if for example, maybe the bid spread was you know, the bid to charge was at 999 and the bid to discharge was at 1000 so really that bid spread is just a dollar, um, what the market would do. Because I'm, I'm curious if it's just a, a fact, if what you're seeing is just um, a result of the bids that are just being submitted at and the price points associated with that rather than the market actually just kind of, for lack of a better term here, ignoring the spread bid. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I have that down. It's um, something to investigate. Okay, thank you. And we do have one last final question here at the moment. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, folks. This is Cody Hill from LS Tower. Hey, um, so I, I wanted to re respond and ask a couple of questions as well. Um, you know, the, the way that Mike from the CPUC described um, you know, the concerns around spread bidding and also the way that many folks have, have indicated a, a desire to further extend the, uh, you know, look ahead in the real-time market further into the future. So just as background, you know, we're one of the only groups that have been operating a large battery, you know, through last summer in the Kaizo market, and we're really excited to have uh, Vistra and AES and a few others now join us uh, here kind of this month and just start getting kind of the same operational experience. But um, what we have seen is that the, the issues with multi-interval optimization and, and big cost recovery related to storage 
um, you know, really come not from a failure to predict far enough into the future, but rather from MIOs look at a um, at, at a window that looks a few intervals into the future and completely forgets the past. And that is one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is that there are just, you know, inaccurate um, guesses as to what's going to happen in the future, right? Forecasting is inherently, inherently going to be imperfect. And therefore, you know, price will guess that there's going to be a high price interval sometime in the future. It may or may not occur. And, and you know, that's just the nature of things. And the further you look into the future, I think most would agree that the more inherently uh, inaccurate forecasts are going to become. So we don't think that, um, you know, looking three hours into the future instead of one hour will make for better outcomes for storage. We think it will make for worse because there will now be even more intervals with even more opportunity for incorrect uh, guesses as to what the future will hold. So we, we really want to push back against kind of this framing that, that we're, we're hearing a lot of here and are you know, happy to engage with the title on it. Um, one question related to big cost recovery specifically, I, I think one of the things that we've, we've seen, and, and I'm not sure if it's um, something that's really on Kites' radar, is that you know we've never seen big cost recovery return any, even, even a single dollar to, to one of our resources uh, in response to energy market dispatch. Um, it does occasionally kick in for uh, ancillary services. But in the energy market, you know, even if multi-interval optimization, you know, clearly goes in and, and causes the resource to lose a few thousand dollars by charging it and then discharging it at, at prices that don't, uh, you, you know, um, result in revenue to the unit, and as long as you haven't lost money for the entire day, um, you don't get made whole for those types of things. So there are lots of, you know, even sub-hourly instances where the resource is dispatched suboptimally does not receive any sort of uh, make whole payment for it, as well as some that take place over, you know, perhaps a few hours. And so maybe shortening the window could work. But I, I think um, it would be good to hear, Bridget, I'm not sure if you're ready to respond to this, but it would be good to hear if Kaiso is looking at um, calculating big cost recovery in a completely different way from, from traditional resources. You know, the uh, calculation as it currently exists was uh, put together for traditional generators that always have a positive output, and, and so their revenue is, of course, you know, just price times output. Um, with batteries, we see that most hours of the day, we're either full or empty and, and doing nothing, and it appears that the BCR algorithm is counting those periods where we are, you know, not being charged because we're full as being periods of profit to us because, you know, our, our dispatch is zero megawatts, even though our bid curve, you know, would allow Kaiso to charge us at some, you know, positive dollar value if, if we were not empty. And that ends up counting as profit even though, of course, there is no revenue accruing to the unit. I'm not sure if you um, have any response to that, but, you know, we'll, we'll put all this stuff in, in uh, comments and look forward to engaging on it. This really is the most important stuff to us as a resource operator. Yeah, thanks so much for those comments. Um, I think we are, um, you know, fairly open to exploring alternate um, possibilities for BCR. And so, yeah, if you could put in um, examples of where you think there might be issues um, in those circumstances you described, um, that would be helpful for us to um, get with our settlement team um, and investigate that further. So, um, or if you have suggestions on, you know, how you think it might be um, appropriate, um, you know, I think at this stage we're, you know, open to exploring those. So um, definitely appreciate um, your feedback and your and operational experience. Um, I think that will be very valuable um, throughout this process. Um, so at this point, yeah, we don't necessarily have a direct comment to that, but um, I do know that we're um, open to exploring that and um, as many examples as you guys can give us to investigate further would be very helpful. Thanks. I really appreciate that, and we'll we'll definitely work with you on it. Um, one other thing that you mentioned on, on this topic, and that I, I think you um, what you said is technically correct, but that it's worth um, thinking about how this initiative can look into it, is that um, you know in most intervals, I, I believe you said that um, you know the, the the dispatch ends up working just fine, and it does end up being in line with. Um, you know, the actual, actual dollar numbers for bids as opposed to um, the spread bid concept. Uh, 
I, you know, I don't have numbers in front of me, but I, I do generally agree with you. I think that in most intervals, yeah, things things do just work uh, just fine. Um, but it is worth pointing out that in our experience, um, things work the worst when the market is at its most volatile, which is kind of when you would like it to, to work the best, of course. Uh, so it's, uh, it works fine in the quiet periods when storage is really not needed, there's not much volatility, and, and things get um, weird and on some days uh, uh, ugly for a resource owner um, when, uh, when there is the most volatility. And, and so figuring out how to kind of um, you know, mean test performance in the periods where it matters the most, and maybe it's uh, you know in hours with the most volatility or, or the most exceptionally high prices, something along the lines of that. But I think if you look at just you know the average of all five minute periods over the course of the year, it, it will not be um, giving you an accurate enough indication of, of the performance of the market when it matters most with, with these storage resources. So we'll, we'll we'll work with you on that as well going forward. Great, thank you. At this time, I don't see any other questions. Thanks a lot, and we do have one written uh, comment slash question from Al. I just want to verbalize this shortly in case Gabe or Bridget or others might have thoughts. Uh, so Alva from pg and &E, thanks for the question, is asking one thought on addressing the horizon of real-time storage decisions. If we're discussing larger market changes, what about using an extended HASP process or our hour ahead scheduling process to block in charge and discharge over a longer real-time horizon, such as eight plus hours? Uh, he's suggesting because the granularity of decisions would not be five minutes, perhaps 15 or 30 minutes or one hour, and the problem might be solvable with existing optimization capabilities. So thanks, Alba, if you could put that in your comments. I'm not sure if anyone else has thoughts on that. Yeah, Jimmy, this is Gabe. Um, I, I think you're right uh, in, in this comment, and I think, frankly, what we're proposing to do is to, at minimum, use results from the day-ahead market, obviously with hourly granularity, to inform what those thresholds uh, that need to be maintained in, in the RTD market are, and then possibly, and, and, you know, there wasn't much ink spilled on this, but it was a description of um, what we put in the paper, we may enhance those uh, results or refine them in the uh, real-time space, um, something like that or something like um, the, the uh, day-ahead reliability tool or some other process where we could use the most up-to-date information about forecasts um, and try to predict um, if there's any change from our day-ahead markets and how much state of charge we need. But we're still talking about, you know, rather than having our RTD or five-minute dispatch process look out hours and hours and hours, having um, requirements imposed on that market that would be um, informed by markets that are run closer to the, the real-time market. Um, with that, I think it's a great segue into the next section. Um, so why don't we, at this point, move on to uh, our next topic, which is replacing the uh, minimum state of charge requirement. Um, and, and Bridget, thank you very much um, for uh, presenting in that last section. So, um, you know, I, I think we've, we've already had quite a bit of discussion about this, um, and it's always nice when the, the questions lead into, you know, the next topic. Um, the ISO over the last few months has been talking about how we develop products um, in our real-time market to ensure that we have enough state of charge to meet the periods when we know we have uh, critical needs from storage resources. So, you know, in the paper, I've worked up a couple of examples, and it's very high-level examples using you know, publicly available data from the ISO website. Um, but essentially, what that data shows and what I'm trying to illustrate in a very simplistic manner is that our forecast um, will require usage of storage resources, specifically energy from storage resources, 
in order to satisfy peak loads in the future. So last summer, you know, we needed every megawatt of capacity that we had on our system, and we did have some storage in the system, so that means inherently that we needed those storage resources to be charged up and we needed them to be available for discharge during at least some certain critical period. Um, I would also add, you know, as we get more and more storage on the system and we're relying on that storage for resource accuracy purposes and we start to see eventually retirements of gas resources or traditional resources that are capable of generating on a 24 by 7 basis, those periods where we're relying on energy storage and that energy storage having state of charge that can be available for dispatch from the ISO market is going to become more and more frequent. So today, and again, I think this largely dovetails with the conversation that we've had earlier and the questions, our day ahead market does optimally charge and discharge storage resources so that we can, uh, you know, serve our load all 24 hours a day. Um, we typically see patterns and, and will continue to see patterns where uh, storage resources are charged in the day ahead market during the lowest price hours. Um, they have the sufficient state of charge through uh, the evening ramp, and then they're scheduled to discharge energy during those critical hours when we need storage resources online to satisfy load. The market uh, charges the storage, yeah. So, so, so we're sent, the, the economics of the market already are set up to do in the day ad market what we need them to do where the storage resources are charging during the lowest net load period and at the same time the lowest price period and then they're discharging during the highest price period or the highest net load period. Obviously, and again, we've discussed this already, the real-time market doesn't make the same decisions. You know, uh, the RTD market specifically is only looking out 65 minutes. Um, so at, you know, 11 o'clock or noon, the RTD market sees an hour-long window. Generally, prices are you know, relatively stable when there's a lot of uh, solar online, and you're not going to see that market inherently tell you, oh, I know it's going to be a really um, high net load day later, and with the anticipated mix of resources that I'm expecting on my market, I'm going to need X amount of you know, megawatt hours of storage, so I better start storing that right now because prices are so low. It doesn't do that. It only looks an hour ahead, so it doesn't have the, the foresight to see um, those future periods when storage from um, batteries is going to be critical. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, these are the same slides and the same examples that I've used in other initiatives. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this too much. Um, this is a net load curve um, from August 14th of last year. Obviously, this is a day during the heat storm. It's a very high net load day. Um, you can see for many hours, the net loads are actually above um, 40 gigawatts. Um, I, I'm just making a very simple assumption here, and, and I, I don't think we need to read too much into this. But I'm just saying, what if we only had – 40 gigawatts of dependable 24 by 7 generation, and then everything else, um, all other needs that the ISO had needed to be met with source resources. Um, in this case, um, you can see there are some hours, and this is the day I had profile, um, there are some hours where the load is above 40,000 megawatts, and the ISO would need storage resources to be charged to serve that load. In this particular case, I've shaded in blue, the total area is 3.6 gigawatt hours. So on the next slide, um, we, just, we just walk through what the day ahead market would do in terms of optimization, and this shouldn't be a surprise. Um, it says, well, I know that net loads are really low earlier in the day, so hours ending 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, so I'm going to ensure that the storage fleet is charging during the lowest price hours, um, which would effectively increase prices during that time. Um, but then later in the day, we're able to serve load because we have that state of charge in the batteries um, when loads are very, very high. So on the next slide, uh, and, and our day ad market does a really good job of this and we come up with an efficient solution. In the real-time market, and this is, you know, what we just talked about, the, the window is much different. You're only looking at an hour uh, period. So you might be looking at a, a period like this where you see loads, um, these are the same load curves, but the real-time curve, 
um, at about 1800 or 6 p.m., the market sees a tremendous need for generation, including, and if you only had 40,000 megawatts of other generation, including a significant amount of need for state of charge. Obviously, at 1800, there is no time to potentially charge your storage fleet. Um, so you sort of waited too long to get to the point where you need to charge storage. So at some point earlier in the day, you need to put requirements in the real-time market to ensure that you have sufficient state of charge to meet your uh, net loads later in the day. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide, Jimmy. Thanks. So in the paper, and, and I know we, we've already had some questions about this, um, I'm going to go through some of the ideas that we're currently thinking about. I would like to see in written comments um, early thoughts about maybe some preferences for each of these tools. Um, I've outlined some of the potential complications to implementing each of these. Um, but, but we do think that there's pros and cons, and I've outlined some of those in the paper. Um, so, er, yeah, early thoughts on how we want to solve this and how, you know, some of these solutions might address some of the other concerns that we've talked about in the presentation. Um, the first one, and this, this isn't a surprise, is just simply expanding the look-ahead market um, into the real-time, uh, the look-ahead period for the real-time market so that we could see um, multiple hours uh, in the future, and we potentially see from our RTD market both the charging periods and the discharging periods in one optimization window. As we mentioned, you know, we've asked our technology team if this could be feasible. I think I understand the comments and the feedback from stakeholders on this call. We'd like to explore that a little bit more and potentially put some rigor around, you know, perhaps dollars um, for costs for these. Um, but at this point, the feedback we've gotten is that this is just not technologically possible at this time. So with that in mind, I think we do need to start exploring other potential options. Um, the other options that we thought about, I, I mean, one of them, and this is being addressed in other uh, stakeholder initiatives and it is a whole separate policy issue on its own, is potentially scarcity pricing. Um, I think, you know, I would certainly agree that if, scarcity pricing was a very, very, very high number, then there would be such a great incentive for storage to always have state of charge needed <clears throat> or scheduled in the day ahead market that it would always be available because of the threat for extremely high scarcity prices. Um, obviously, there could be some other complications introduced from that, um, today, the ISO currently has a $2,000 per megawatt hour um, scarcity price. Uh, there's another initiative set up this year to talk about scarcity pricing, which may have some impact on storage resources. Um, but for now, uh, I, I think this scarcity pricing factor is, is relatively set, and we're not really planning to address that in this policy. So what that leaves us with is three potential alternatives and perhaps some other alternatives about how we could um, set this requirement in the real-time market to ensure that we do have state of charge. I think the first thing we could do is we could potentially augment the rules that we have right now for um, the minimum state of charge requirement. For example, this is a very targeted tool that's only applicable on the absolute most extreme days um, in our market. We could expand that to be a tool that's used uh, more or less on a, on a daily basis, and we could just simply introduce a price that we pay resources who are providing um, or are required to have state of charge in the real-time market and are potentially held out of the real-time market. You know, the, an early way, uh, and again, you know, I don't want to have too much discussion about potential solutions here as we are just exploring the issues. Um, but, but early thinking about this could be something along the lines of, well, these storage resources that are effectively being held out of the real-time market are going to suffer some lost opportunity. If we can calculate what that opportunity cost is, that might be one way of compensating them. Um, a second idea is something brand new, something maybe called, you know, something like an energy shift product. Essentially, it would be a buy and a sell transaction that occur in the day ahead market um, and effectively would come with a minimum state of charge threshold 
in the real-time market, so you'd, once you bought the energy in the real-time market, you'd be required to hold on to it. Um, and there'd be compensation around that where storage resources could bid into um, the market at what that opportunity is to perform energy shift during a specific day. And once we had that value, um, we could just simply provide the compensation for it. Um, or, or something like that. And we'd like to hear alternatives in uh, feedback from stakeholders on this. And then the final idea is something I think a little bit easier in terms of a concept, uh, but maybe more difficult in terms of implementation, which would be a biddable state of charge product, where in the real-time market, we're not only procuring energy and answering services, we're also procuring state of charge. And we have specific quantities of state of charge that we need to attain, and as long as we hit those quantities, um, then we clear the market. And that state of charge is biddable, so, um, you know, we, we just simply procure up to the point, you know, we, we procure from the least cost resources first, and then once we've satisfied our constraint, we um, stop procurement, and, and this would be relatively straightforward. We might need to set requirements um, for a state of charge product up in regional areas or potentially local areas as well to make sure we're getting enough state of charge in those areas. Um, but otherwise, we see this um, as being one potential solution. So my ask in the written comments is I'd like to hear feedback on, you know, at a very high level, which of these ideas might be more appealing to uh, market participants and why. And then um, we can start to actually dive into the details of developing a solution, and we might offer um, details on alternative solutions as we come up with and draft our straw proposal for the next iteration of this project. Uh, so, Jimmy, I think I've got one more slide on this topic. If we could advance. Thank you. Um, so, a couple things that we want to keep in mind, um, and, and I did mention this earlier, we are currently setting the requirements for the minimum state of charge today based on um, day ahead market results. We understand that things change from when we run the day ahead market as we move into real time. You could have additional outages. You could have resources come back from outage. You could have um, reduction in what you expect the loads to be. You could have changes in what your forecasts are for the variable fleet. So there's a lot of different things um, that can change in the real-time market. So using information to set any requirements that we have in the real-time market as close to the real-time market as possible, I think would be advantageous and would ultimately reduce costs and get us to a better solution um, in the real-time market. So I think we want to explore how we can use the best, most up-to-date forecast information to inform any kind of constraint that we put on the real-time market um, as we move forward in this process. So I just ask stakeholders to continue to think about that as well. And then finally, I would ask, um, and, and what we hope, is that any solution that we do develop is security constrained um, so that it works with uh, the, the fleet that we have, we're not going to cause any um, undue congestion on our system, you know, to the extent we can avoid it. And then, um, yeah, we, we account for transmission congestion with any amount of storage procured. And then we also, if we need to um, address any zonal needs or local needs um, through the procurement of the, these resources. So ideas about solutions, again, at a higher level um, along these lines would be helpful for us as we start to formulate how we want to move in this policy. Um, I, I am just going to note the time here. It's 11.05. Um, we do have a few more slides to get through. So I think we can take questions either from the chat or from uh, the phone, uh, but I'm going to put a hard stop on this, a conversation on this topic at 11.30 so we can get through all the slides. So with that, um, Jimmy, do we have any comments in the chat? Thanks, Gabe. I'm looking at the chat now, see anything for now. Um, so, operator, I don't know if we have anything in the queue. We do have three questions in the queue. Would you like to take them? Great. Let's go ahead. 
Now your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, Gabe. Uh, Mike Kramick from Boston Energy. How are you? Hey, Mike. I'm doing well. Thank you. I guess I just got a general question, and maybe just – I guess I don't share the same philosophy as the ISO, but, but in this whole discussion of needing storage resources to be available during the, you know, the, the net peak, which is, quote, unquote, the highest price hours, why doesn't the ISO just rely on its pricing? If the, if the market is priced correctly – and the real-time prices and FMM prices and day-ahead prices reflect that need, stored resources will be there. Because if they're not, they're, they have the risk of buying back at extremely high prices. So I don't understand why the ISO doesn't trust its market to price the energy correctly so that resources will be there when it's needed. I guess that's why I just don't understand why you're not focusing more on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mike. Um, I, if I recall, we, we the got... hours where you needed it last year, real-time prices did not reflect the this in, in all cases the system conditions. So I think you need to. I don't know why ISO doesn't trust this real-time pricing scheme. I guess that's my overall question. Yeah. So the yeah the, the, I mean and that's a good question. Um, the issue is the look ahead horizon for the RTD market. So if it's 5 p.m. and we have to have storage resources charged later in the day to meet our PCAT load, let's just say it's 7 p.m., um, our real-time market sees from 5 to 6 p.m. and it says, okay, um, I'm going to take the least cost resources to meet my um, current needs, my current load. And if a storage resource is bidding in in such a way and says, hey, as long as prices are $150 or greater in the real-time market, go ahead and discharge my battery, then today the real-time market will do that, except for situations where the minimum state of charge requirement is imposed, which – which is more or less trying to do what, what we're talking about here. So, so the, the ISO market will go ahead and discharge that storage resource. Later, at 7 p.m., the market comes up with a solution and says, oh, because I've discharged my storage resource, I now can't serve load. So ideally, if, if the market could sort of back up to 5 p.m. again and make a different decision, it would, and it would say, well, I can discharge this much more expensive $200 per megawatt resource instead of the battery and save my state of charge for later because I know that I'm going to need those storage resources later. And that's, and that's the problem. But, Gabe, don't you think that a storage resource, if, if I have, if I, let's say I sold day ahead in peak at $200, and if I'm a storage resource and there's a risk that real-time prices could be $1,000 in those peak hours, do you think I'm going to I'm going to structure my bids in those pre, in those prior hours to make sure that I have enough state of charge to meet my day ahead award because I don't want to buy back at eight hundred dollars. I, I think you're not giving the storage resources enough credit that they know how to manage their assets because no one's gonna, no one's going to reasonably say, well, I'll take a hundred and fifty dollar profit, but I have a risk of, of losing eight hundred dollars over the four hour peak. I think I'm going to adjust my bidding approach to make sure I can probably meet my day ahead offer. And I think you need to give, you need to consider that when you're coming up with these rules because you're basically, in effect, doing out of market actions because you don't, the Kaiso doesn't either, one, believe its pricing is, is accurate, or two, believe that the storage resource can, can accurately and properly represent its, its resource to maximize not only its revenues but also minimize its risk. So I guess that's all I have. No. Thanks. I absolutely agree that storage resource operators can bid in such a way to minimize their revenue stream. I absolutely believe that. And because I believe that, I think that there is a certain price in the real-time market which storage resources, resource operators 
are willing to accept to discharge energy earlier in the day on the chance that they could potentially incur very high cost penalty price costs later in the day. Um, I think I think that that price varies as you vary the penalty price. But I do I, I sincerely believe that storage resources are sophisticated enough to figure that out, and they're not always going to have state of charge when the ISO may may need them critically, and that could result in reliability concerns for the ISO, and that's why we need to do this. And, and I'm not saying, I, I'm certainly not saying anytime there's a day ahead schedule, we need to make sure that we have state of charge to meet that day ahead schedule. What I'm saying is when the ISO critically needs state of charge from the storage fleet, there has to be some way for the ISO market to ensure that that state of charge is there, the ISO RTD market to ensure that it's there. And that's what we need to develop. But I, but I appreciate the comment, Mike. Thank you. I'll go to the next question here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hello, this is uh, Kathleen Colbert from Vistra again. Um, thanks very much for this. This is helpful. Um, this, uh, I think you're walking through these slides uh, can just makes me want to echo my request again. Um, for the workshops. Um, I think I heard you say that you wanted some feedback on, on potential solutions or options that you went through in response to these comments. Um, and respectfully, I just want to give some direct feedback so you're not surprised. In two weeks from now, at least from my part, I'm not going to be comfortable providing written comments to the CAISO with any kind of proposal or ranking or um, any kind of narrowing down of potential of the solution sets because I don't feel like, I feel like we just started the issue conversation and I'm incredibly hopeful that our request to have a workshop to talk through the issues before going into solutions is one that the Kaiser is going to entertain and set up hopefully in June so that we can all come together and talk about these issues. Take back your uh, representation of them really think through them, look at market experience, and then bring back an operational feedback to you in June. And then out of that, we'll have confirmed the, the issues, and then we can talk about solutions. So I just don't want you to be surprised, Gabe, that if you don't see specific preferences in these comments, you may, but they may not honestly be all that well informed. And then as we learn more, people may revise those preferences. So I do really wanna, make sure the CAISO is hearing our request to hold a workshop to go through these issues before getting to comments and um, identifying solutions. I feel like that will be right from after that workshop, so maybe early July. And if you could take this into consideration um, when you're mapping out your schedule, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Hey, Kathleen, thanks for the feedback. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned because the whole purpose of this meeting is to discuss, you know, what ISO believes the issues that some of the storage resources are experiencing are, and that's that's hopefully what we're getting feedback on this call and through our, um, you know, uh, questions and and the, you know, the, the written feedback is, um, you know, having another workshop to specifically think or work through some of these issues to me, doesn't seem like a great use of time. Um, I'm, I'm very eager, and I think, I, I'm hoping that a lot of the stakeholder community is eager to start developing solutions. Um, and if, if, if we're not able to outline or articulate the right problems here, I, I, I feel like we, we might be missing something, you know, um, and, and I think, the ISO setting up a workshop just to talk about issues um, might not be useful if, if we're not getting out of this conversation that same feedback. 
Um, so if, if there is a, a real breakdown in communication here and, and I'm, I'm missing something huge, please let me know. Um, but I am not planning to hold a workshop to, to go through in general issues from storage. What I would be willing to entertain and, and what I think we likely will need to do is once we start developing solutions and, and we want to sort of roll up our sleeves and start working through issues about implementation for solutions, that might be the appropriate time to employ a workshop. But, but maybe, I've, maybe I've completely missed something here. No, I appreciate that feedback, Tim. So maybe let, let me talk through our hopes, dreams, and vision, um, and per, perhaps that will help at least provide context so you can um, take this back to uh, management and the team and talk about it. Um, so in my mind, yeah, I totally 100% um, this meeting is for the purpose, understand for the CAISO to lay out their views on the issues existing for storage. 100% will provide feedback on those issues. Do not anticipate providing any preference on solutions um, at this time. Would want to continue exploring and looking into education. So for, I'll tell you the two things that I see a workshop having value. Um, the first one is education. So one of the options that you raised was uh, kind of compensating for holding a stated charge. So my specific request is that when we ideally have a follow-up workshop just to get into the nitty gritties, um, that the KISO, the portion of that, the way that I would envision the KISO's role in that workshop would be similar to past workshops that you've held in, in, in you know, impactful stakeholder efforts that you provide education. Here's some benchmarking here. Let's have a discussion about um, and explain to California stakeholders what options may exist in, in today's framework in other markets. For example, I'd really like you to consider bringing back an explanation. Um, examples of um, PJM uses a lost opportunity cost settlement mechanism to incentivize kind of uh, resources staying to their day ahead schedules, but then not um, and then making them hold to the lost opportunity cost of not um, responding in the real time market. It's not a one to one, of course, it would have to be approximated, but it would be a good starting place to like, let's get into what types of mechanisms are used in other markets to, to kind of do to incentivize the response that you're looking for. Once we understand kind of how the, the functionality that is available in um, to vendors today, um, then we can go to the solution. If that's the issue, if that's the solution that's preferred, we have a benchmark on how it could be addressed. Then we can look into how does it need to be modified for the types of market um, application. That would be very useful. Other examples we may um, bring for the other how would the other two options that, because clearly I hear that KISO has three preferences, how do you envision that to work? Let's talk through an example. That will give me the context substance to provide response to you on solutions. The other thing that I envision in the workshop that I truly think would have value in this is to allow stakeholders to present um, a brief slide deck describing the experiences in operations in the markets that we are having, what those challenges are, and to open it up to the community so that we can as a whole talk about these issues, both from a KISO perspective and market participants perspective. I heard LS get some really great feedback and input on this call. It'd be great to have LS, if they were interested, to provide, you know, a talk provide their insights at a workshop. This group would be happy to provide our insights at a workshop. We are providing um, feedback on, a, on an ongoing basis with KISO um, already, but we, we'd be happy to talk through these challenges as a part of the stakeholder community so that we can all be on the same page and aligned on the issues. Um, and I think there are likely other large storage operators who might be willing to do that as well. And I think that workshop would be very beneficial. In my mind, I see it kind of similarly to the way that the demand response workshops were held um, under the CCE3 project. 
I really thought that was in a successful framework. Market participants came, they gave, had brief slide decks, they gave their presentations. Tyso and the stakeholders had very productive, enthusiastic back and forth. And out of that, um, I think some really targeted issues were identified and a, and a framework. And when you look at that DR plan, out of those workshops, they identified specific elements Tyson's, whether or not they were going to address those elements or not, it's a, it was a really, really good example of productive stakeholdering, and I highly encourage you to look at that, and that is what I have in my mind. I can give you other examples I also felt like, but I don't want to toot my own horn, felt like the CCW workshops were incredibly beneficial and successful to driving the stakeholder community toward the consensus on the issue. We also gave education so they knew what we were talking about before we came forward with a solution. Um, and to me, that is not a waste of time. And so I just highly encourage the CAISO to entertain this kind of robust collaborative stakeholdering. Okay, thanks. We can look into that. And we do have a few other questions here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, your phone might be on mute. Please go ahead. The phone number ending one five four three. You've been unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. This is Mike Castellano from the CPUC. Um, so stretching back a little bit to Mike from Boston Energy, uh, just, the issue isn't really, um, you know, what price risk those resources have. The KISO's bid cost recovery system is designed to ensure that as long as those resources follow um, KISO dispatch, they're not actually exposed to that price risk. Uh, and there are very good reasons for that. I mean, you're going back to sort of the early days of renewable integration on that one. Um, I would also say that in response to what Kathleen was saying, I don't know that we're really going to know a whole lot more after this summer. Um, I think the operational landscape is a little bit tricky to figure out right now. It's definitely possible that we end up dealing with, one, the MSOC, and two, lots of exceptional dispatch this summer. Um, and I, don't, I just don't see how that's going to inform, you know, the, the ideal market, the ideal structures that we want moving forward. If, if we're really just talking about minor incremental improvements to the existing system, I guess it could be useful, but I'm still hoping that we're going to get something more uh, holistic on how we run the grid and how we run the market. Um, but I also say that, uh, you know, the limitation of any of those workshops comes down to how much information people are willing to share. When we've had workshops on storage operation and bidding before, um, it's kind of of limited use because nobody wants to throw their bids up on the board. Um, and without that information, it's really hard to figure out, it's hard for people like or entities like the CPUC staff or other sort of anybody besides who's presenting to really know what's going on. Um, so I, I would just say that, you know, those workshops, in my view, are not all that valuable unless there's a lot more information than has been presented in the past. Um, uh, similar for CCW, Kathleen seems to have a much rosier memory of those than I do. But, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for those comments, Mike. Um, operator, next call, please, if we have any more. And we do have one more. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Sergio Lainez with the California Energy Storage Alliance. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can, Sergio. Thanks. Great. Um, so I wanted to offer a couple of um, comments and on our thoughts regarding the potential solutions that have been outlined in the paper. Um, so 
First off, uh, I'd like to echo the, the comments that, you know, have been shared before of the importance of evaluating the cost-benefit analysis of extending the look-ahead period for the real-time market. Um, we think that while other solutions that are have been contemplated for this issue before, an IRA enhancement or that are included within the issue paper uh, could work, there's really not a, a very concise argument on why we shouldn't strive for a longer look ahead period in the real time market, even if it's a long term solution, even if it's not the direct outcome of this uh, initiative, it would be important that within here we still build, start building the record to see why, uh, how can we get there, what would be the cost, what would be the benefits associated with it, because as Mike uh, Castellano said, it's important that we start thinking about sort of this um, future optimal market operation that we want. And I think while it can be technologically feasible today uh, to expand it, um, I think it will be very uh, enriching for stakeholders to understand what's really the cost benefit trade-off uh, in the coming years. Um, so we would love to see that within this initiative as well. Second, um, I see, uh, we're glad to see that the ISO is considering the creation of this energy shifting product. Uh, and I, what I'd like to share here is we think that, that this product could have, uh, you know, repercussions really outside of the issue that the MSOC is trying to get at. Uh, and really actually help the development and contracting of, of energy storage. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is that really this product can ease, uh, you know, contracting because in the future, and actually not even that far off, the main thing that we want energy storage doing is shifting energy, right? Like flattening the net load, taking us from from a, a, a position where we have these incredible ramps and instead trying to flatten them, meet them, and continuously doing diurnal and even seasonal shifting later on. Um, so I do think this solution has promise, uh, but it, again, should be evaluated uh, sort of in line or in parallel with the longer-term solution of just extending the real-time uh, horizon. We'd love to see data on that. And finally, um, I have a, a quick question. Uh, Gabe, I don't know if the, the team has thought of sort of the approach to potentially shortlist the various solutions that have been uh, proposed in the issue paper. Of course, we think that, you know, it's very useful to have the pros and cons that you have included in the paper, uh, but we'd like to know if you think that we will move later on trying to develop all of the solutions until we reach some form of consensus. Would a working group dynamic be useful? Do you have criteria or thoughts on how you could shortlist the solutions? Yeah, um, I think internally we've talked a little bit about that. Um, I think, you know, when we get ready to present something externally, I, I think I'd want to have a little bit more time to prepare explicitly what we're going to say about that. Um, but but it, it certainly is something that we've been thinking about externally. Um, just along the same lines as this comment, um, I would just encourage you, Sergio, and others out there um, to, to include these asks in your comments, in your written comments, so that we do have, uh, just like Sergio was implying, a, a, a record of this. I think it's going to be important and I think the more, you know, internally we show that this is a, a really critical question and a lot of people are thinking and wondering about this, I think, um, you know, hopefully the more discussion and, and the more we can show that there's a need for this internally. Um, you know, I, I appreciate those comments on uh, the Energy Shift product too. I think, uh, you know, a lot of these potential solutions um, offer some you know, uh, there's a lot of benefits, and, and I think there, there could be uh, some, a lot of good that comes out of a lot of these products. 
But thank you for those comments, Sergio. Um, it is 11.30, uh, so I do want to move on. We have two more topics to, co to cover before the end of the presentation, um, and I do want to end on time. Um, so I think for the sake of time, let's go ahead and advance um, to the next topic, which is variable charging rate. Um, and then I, we, I will take uh, written comments after this section, and then Bridget will present on exceptional dispatch, um, and we can go through verbal comments at that, or I'm sorry, written comments at that point. And then if we have additional time left over, we can take more verbal comments, uh, but otherwise uh, we'll have to conclude for today and, we'll, and we will be reading the written comments that we get from this process. Okay, um, so Jimmy, if we could advance to the variable charging rate slide. Great, thank you. So um, one of the issues that we've heard about is um, that the charging rates degrade as storage resources approach full state of charge. So as you get more and more state of charge, the effective PMIN or the ability to charge the resource um, gets less and less and less. Um, we've heard from some resources that are, you know, quote unquote, oversized, and they are modeled in such a way that effectively the entire range of the battery is um, able to charge at PMIN, whereas other resources are modeled in a different way, and you know, the, the capacity that they're showing to the ISO and modeling in master files um, has this issue. So we are asking, and, and again, I think this is, you know, one of the issues that I, I think could be out there, is the current model sufficient for um, resources that you're planning to uh, have participate in the, in the market? And if it's not, you know, what sort of things do we need to think about in our model, and is it as simple as having a um, charging rate that's going to change state of charge, um, and then we could potentially start thinking about how to implement a solution like that in our straw proposal. Um, so, Jimmy, at this point, I'm, I'm not sure, do we have any um, written comments at, at, at this point? I don't see any written comments, thanks Gabe, uh, but as a reminder to folks that Susan helpfully brought up for saving the chat, uh, you are able, folks, to go to the file uh, on the top of the screen and, and go to save or print, and you should have the option to save or print the chat, so just FYI for folks. But yeah, no, no chat questions, Gabe. Okay, that's great. Um, so with that, I think we are ready to go into our last um, substantive topic, which is exceptional dispatch, and I'll turn it over to Bridget for this. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so we can move to the next slide. So exceptional dispatch uh, is an instruction to a resource to provide a target megawatt value. And so this target megawatt, megawatt value is compensated um, at bid or better. Um, so this works for most resources. However, um, there's been some questions around if there are potential improvements that can be made on how our operators are exceptionally dispatching storage resources. So operators may want to have a specific amount of state of charge um, set up for the grid uh, at a later point in the day. And so currently they have to submit a target megawatt value that may or may not reflect the state of charge they really want to get out of the resource. And so there's been some questions around whether we could create a specific exceptional dispatch tool um, that would um, position storage at a specific um, target state of charge, so a megawatt hour value rather than a megawatt value, um, which would help the market set the resource up and avoid some funky things that can happen. So for instance, we've seen instances where uh, the operators may put in a megawatt target of um, say 10 megawatts at a later point, and if the resource is to charge, uh, and if the resource is doesn't have that headroom um, to accommodate that schedule, the market may discharge the resource in anticipation of having to 
charge it up to meet that exceptional dispatch. And so if we had something like a target um, state of charge value, then the market could avoid this by knowing you're at 90%, the operators want you to be at 100% at this hour, and so it would only charge you up as necessary to meet that target rather than discharging you to create the headroom to then charge you up again. Um, additionally, um, there may be a need for additional compensation mechanisms around exceptional dispatches. So for instance, um, if the operators are um, holding back storage um, for use later in the day and issuing either zero or small incremental um, target megawatt values to hold the resource back, um, there's not really a way to accurately compensate resources for holding them um, at a certain level of state of charge um, because, again, they're compensated better, better but if the um, dispatch is at zero megawatts, there's nothing to compensate. Um, and so there's been um, an ask to consider whether or not we should create um, compensation for lost opportunity costs for holding back resources. Um, and so for exceptional dispatch, what we're looking at is, is there um, a way to more specifically target state of charge um, and give operators better tools to manage um, these resources? And are there additional compensation mechanisms um, that may be fair because um, Unlike other resources, um, storage may be dispatched to hold state of charge. And again, they're being taken out of the real-time market and there may be um, lost opportunity costs that aren't captured in the current bit or better settlement framework. Um, so those are the things we've heard about around the sectional, exceptional dispatch um, that we might consider in this initiative. Um, so with that, um, let's see if we have any um, chat questions and then um, we have a few minutes left, so um, we may be able to take a few more verbal questions as well. All right, thank you very much. I don't see any chat questions to operator. Please feel free to manage the queue if anyone's there. We do have three questions in the queue. Would you like to hear it? Yes, please. All right, your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello guys, uh, this is Sandy Fedora with Dallas Power. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, well, great. Uh, well, first of all, Gabe, Bridget, thank you so much uh, for uh, taking this stakeholder initiative. Very timely, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, important uh, issues that we're all trying to address through this initiative. Just, uh, you know, one overarching comment uh, that I have about the process, you know, I, I am uh, with you, Gabe. We would we would like to see a discussion on solutions and uh, possibly start to, you know implementing those solutions uh, sooner than later. Because as as you know, I mean right now there's only a few hundred megawatts. It's going to get to a very large uh, you know size uh, in in a very short time. So sooner we start hitting on solutions and implementing these solutions, and kind of just uh, also you know, tag along with uh, Sergio in the recommendations that he was making. You know, we might want to look at kind of, you know, developing solutions in, in different phases, different timelines. Some solutions might be, you know, quicker and easier to implement. Uh, and, and one in particular, and I think Sergio talked about this as well, is uh, the MIO, uh, the way it's uh, currently, you know, uh, it, it, it's currently implemented. We, you know, again, as my colleague uh, Cody mentioned, we have operational experience uh, with storage for uh, for a couple of years now, and uh, we strongly believe that making adjustments to MIO the way it's uh, implemented today to storage, I, I, you know, we think can provide solutions that might uh, reduce the need for implementing some of these other solutions that we're discussing. So just, you know, I would say highly prioritize on developing an MIO solution. And then again, I, you know, just like uh, my colleague Cody said, you know, we want to go in the opposite direction, uh, you know, rather than um, extending the timeline for real-time market, uh, you're rather reducing uh, the timeline for uh, the, uh, you know, mining and advisory uh, intervals. 
uh, or I guess I would say the advisory at 12. I mean, right now there's a lot of, and, and, and Boston Energy made this comment, you know, why would the storage assets not uh, be incented to kind of, you know, meet their needs and be able to provide energy during these uh, evening peak hours? I mean, you're absolutely right. We have every incentive to be able to to do that. You know, we're exposed to huge market risks if we do not do that. But again, you know, sometimes uh, there could be, you know, instances where MIO might uh, dispatch you in, in a completely different uh, direction, leaving you empty uh, before that evening peak. Uh, where you know, so so in other words, a storage operator might be doing everything. Uh, by putting in bids in the market that effectively turn into these uh, evening discharge uh, awards and be able to meet those awards. But again, if, if things are not, you know, lined up correctly with respect to this MIO-based dispatch, uh, they could definitely get in your way and, uh, you know, uh, an operator would really be really helpless at that point to be able to meet those evening uh, discharge awards. So again, you know, Try to get into solutions here, but I think you know, we need to start thinking about what solutions are uh, easier, quicker to implement, which ones might uh, help address or reduce the need for some of these other solutions. Um, just a quick comment on BCR. Uh, I heard uh, Mike mention that BCR would cover for certain situations, you know, in case the bids were not lined up. Our experience, you know, as again, I think uh, my colleague Cody said, we have not made a single BCR, you know, payment in the last, we've not been awarded any BCR for the last two plus years. And uh, and I think BCR overall you know, is, is rightly so part of uh, the stakeholder initiative. I think it's an important topic uh, that uh, does, a, does BCR, the way it's uh, implemented today, does that even work for storage? So, uh, you know, definitely uh, we would like to see further discussion on that. I would uh, just uh, end by saying this, uh, Kathleen and, and others, you, know, you guys are other uh, developers or other market participants. You know, if you guys would like to understand these issues a little bit better, you know, I, I'm, I'm with uh, Gabe, you know, I would rather start developing solutions sooner, but by way of Helping expedite all this, I mean, I would extend an invitation. You can, you know, reach out to us. You reach out to CISA. There's a lot of uh, good discussion that has already been taking place, you know, within that forum. And, uh, you know, we're happy to bring anybody who is not up to speed on what these issues are. Happy to bring you guys up to speed so we don't uh, essentially uh, delay the catalyst or stakeholder process. And like I said, you know, we would really like to start seeing implementation of these solutions because, uh, you know, it's in benefit of market participants and KISO. I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, Gabe or, or uh, Bridget. Uh, none for me. Thanks for the feedback, Sandy. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. Um, one thing that your comments uh, remind me of is I want to remind folks that um, through the ESDER 4, we also developed the optional end of hour state of charge fit in parameter. Um, that folks can use to better manage their state of charge. Um, and so that will be coming into place in fall 2021. Um, so just wanted to remind folks that, um, you know, we will have this uh, solution in place in the fall that can help um, storage owners better manage state of charge, um, which could also help address um, reserving some energy for meeting day head schedules and meeting those um, critical um, hours as well. Um, so um, just wanted to Keep that in mind that that um, solution is um, in development and will be available um, in the coming future. So as you're thinking through your comments, you know, kind of keep in mind um, if there is um, issues that aren't addressed by the end of our state charge parameter um, or, um, you know, it's, some of these issues could be um, and will be addressed through that um, policy as well. So, um, we hadn't mentioned it before, so I just wanted to um, bring that back to people's attention that um, we do have this um, additional um, bid parameter um, in the works um, that can also help manage state of charge. Uh, we do have a few more questions here. 
Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, it's Callie Wells with WPTF. I actually had a question back on the variable charging rate slide that Gabe covered. Um, so based on the description of this issue in the paper, it sounds like this is similar to um, kind of what gas-fired resources have today, where they have kind of a segmented ramp rate, so the ramp rate over their operating range changes, um, and the model already allows for that. Is that something that the CAISO could leverage to address this issue, just allowing storage resources to have varying operating rates depending on their operating range, or charging rates depending on their operating range? Yeah, I, I think this would be similar um, to that, Some, something like that, yes. Okay, and um, I guess just if, as you guys kind of go back, um, if you can see if it's, you know, if maybe that's an easy functionality that already exists to leverage um, to address the solution. It was just a thought I had, but thank you. Yep, Th thanks for the feedback, Kelly. Appreciate it. And I do have one last question here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. This is uh, Kathleen Colbert from Vistra again. I had a question on this slide as well, uh, slide 20 on the charging rate. I just wanted to confirm that when you're talking through this issue that it is unrelated to the management of depth of discharge. Yeah, this, this is not related to, to discharge. This is related to um, the rate at which storage resources are physically capable of charging um, as they get to, you know, very high levels of state of charge in the facility. Um, yeah, just to clarify, depth of discharge has to do with the amount of charge that you can use um, based on warranties. So I didn't think it was related, but I was just confirming. Um, I haven't heard you mention depth of discharge, but I have heard you mention round trip efficiencies during this call, and I just wanted to double check this wasn't a portion of what you were raising. At the end. No, uh, you're correct. We, we haven't touched on that. Um, if that is an issue that you think warrants um, investigation, put it in your comments, and you know we'll we'll try to think about that too. Just confirming. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. And at this time, I don't see any other questions. Okay, um, then uh, Jimmy, we'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Gabe and Bridget and everybody for participating today. Uh, very informational and, and we hope uh, to see some very uh, thorough comments along the lines of uh, what to include in scope. Hopefully we've uh, presented what you need as far as taking away from this discussion, any uh, takeaways that you'd like to include uh, for scope items. And as we mentioned, look forward to the straw proposal after this iteration, uh, which will begin the actual uh, proposals along the solution space uh, discussion that we're all looking to get to. So. With that, we are looking for comments, as always, two weeks from today on May 19th. Uh, we are asking to go through the commenting tool, as most are hopefully familiar with by now, which can be found on our stakeholder page, as noted right there for you. And we do have some time back, so thank you so much for being mindful of comments. This is really great input that we've taken today. And on the last note, you are able to save the chat uh, so you can, you know, not worry about about writing everything down by going to the, again, file, and then save or print, and then you should see save or print chat there. So hopefully that helps. And we look forward to your comments. And as a reminder, it was recorded. So you can look for the MP4 file to be posted on the initiative page here in the next couple of business days. And with that, folks, please have a great rest of your day. And that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.